your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house. This is getting beyond my control. Today we're going to do something a little bit different than what we usually do. There wasn't a whole lot going on in pop culture this week, so we decided we'd talk about one of our favorite things in the whole wide world, interrogation. Deciding which interrogation video to break down wasn't hard at all, because you let us know what you wanted to see in the comments. And when the panelists speak, we listen. So we're going to talk about the interrogation of Colonel Russell Williams, a longtime panelist favorite. You might think that's going to be pretty exciting, but it's not going to be exciting. It's going to be horrifically boring. It's what we like. There's nothing to do in pop culture, so we're going to nerd out on it. There's a lot of silence in the videos we're going to be watching. That's because nobody's talking. And that uncomfortable silence <laughs> is what we feed on. So again, we're going to talk about body language. But more than that, we're going to talk about interrogation. All right. You ready? Here we go. I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. I'm Chase Hughes. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I teach intelligence agencies and the general public in extreme forms of persuasion, interrogation, and people reading. Greg. Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior and put together this course, the number one body language course online, bodylanguagetactics.com with Scott Rouse. I spend most of my time on Wall Street and in corporate America. All right. Today, we're going to talk about a guy named Colonel Russell Williams. And uh, we got the panelists. Every, we get, you know, tons of those every week, every asking for this. So there wasn't a whole lot going on in pop culture. So what we decided we would do was focus on this one, on uh, Russell Williams, because what it is, is, is it's an interrogation. And most of the time we focus just on body language or mostly on body language. But this time we're going to focus on interrogation because we get a lot of requests for that as well. So today it's going to be a little bit boring. We're going to geek out and nerd out on interrogation and you'll <laughs> learn a lot from it. But we will be talking about body language, but not as much as we usually do. It's going to be mostly focused on interrogation. Greg, you got anything you want to say? Yeah. So, guys, I'm a pig in mud here. I spent most of my life doing this. Mark, you not being an interrogator need to be the guy who keeps us sane and makes us not go too deep because three of us have spent our entire lives here, and I spent more than most people's lifetime doing this crap. So we, we're going to love it. We're going to dig into it. We'll nerd out a little. Mark, keep us at the body language and the sane part, and don't let us go too deep. I'll do that. All right. All right. You guys ready? Yeah. Here yep. we go. You just have to see Russell. I was speaking with him. whatever night that was, was Russ as well. Oh, yeah. And he took, uh, took every number I had. Yeah, now they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. Right. Glad to see you. Uh, I'm just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone just yeah. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, <laughs> you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed. Oh, no? Okay. No. Let's get this set up here. Well, I guess the closest uh, interview by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh, yeah? All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it. it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville Way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, sure. So uh, again, I appreciate it. No um, we're gonna do a pretty thorough interview today. Okay. okay? Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee guy or I not, but I didn't want to drink in front of you, so... No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely... Are they black? Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. Um, I'm definitely going to take them out. I'll probably have it a little bit. 
Serves you what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. Piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right. And again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat people, everybody with respect. I don't want mm -hmm. to ask you to do the same for me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are. Okay? okay. Just like everybody else. All right. Greg, you want to go first? Sure. Now here, guys, you're going to hear the interrogation instructor in me. I'm going to tell you things you may or may not want to hear. And Mark, keep me honest here. But interrogation is a process. Everybody thinks it's voodoo and the guy just says what he wants to say. And that process, regardless of what you call it, will fall into a handful of categories. It starts off with establishing control. And by establishing control, I mean put a fence around what we're going to do and how we're going to behave. We always also establish identity. We make sure we're talking to the right person. This is the interrogation cycle. Then we establish rapport. And that's small talk, and it means nothing. It's simply me trying to get you into a place where you feel comfortable. Then I run an approach, and I'll go through approaches as we run through here today. But approaches are psychological ploys, things like fear up, fear down, about pride and ego up, pride and ego down, futility. And I can list them all off. They're 14. I'll go through them as we go through here because he's going to use about seven of them if I remember right. And then once I get the approach going, I start my questioning technique. But I never forget the approach that's working and I keep reinforcing it. It's an approach questioning, extract information, redrive the approach. And then once I get what I need, I terminate. And termination quite simply means finish the conversation. This has use in daily life. I use it in corporate America to teach people to run businesses. Quite simply use the same basic process. And I'll run back through that as we go through here. But I want you to get your head around establish control, establish ID, establish rapport, run an approach, questioning, and then we'll see termination at the end. He starts off in his establishing control by not using this guy's title. The minute you start using a title, you put a guy on notice and he straightens his uniform and goes back to who he is. But when you call him Russell, you've taken him out of that uniform and he's a human being and you're starting down that way. He's starting by developing that rapport. Then I always said rapport doesn't need to be positive. It can be negative. Hey, scumbag, sit in that chair and answer my question. I had enough of you. That's a, a, a way of approach, approaching rapport as well. But he immediately begins collecting information. And you'll see that this colonel's face is straight on and he does something really dumb, really dumb. And that's chew gum because your jaw works at the rate your brain works. And you can watch it as he goes through. It's going to ramp up and then stop. And it'll be a really good indicator. I'm going to tell you that based on my experience, I would just about guarantee you that Colonel Russell Williams is resistance trained. There are a couple of things that jump off the plate at me, and I'm not going to point those out simply because. When this guy starts off, he's not your friend. He's setting up the parameters. He's establishing control, and he even smooths when he reads your rights. Hey, we do this for everybody. The only real immediately um, immediate jump off the plate from the colonel is he does a resume statement, as you would call it, Scott or uh, Chase, and he tries to save some face by saying, when I did my top secret clearance interviews, the only time I've been this way. Well, there you go. That right there saying, look, I'm trustworthy. Look, I'm a man of God. Look out for me. That's the beginning of this. And I'll leave it at that because there's a ton of other stuff here I don't want to jump into. But this is a great start. Remember the process because the process is going to make a difference here. And then I'll loop back at the end of this and give you how you can use this in your daily life in meetings. As soon as we finish this section, if you don't want to watch that, skip over it. Scott, what do you got? All right. I th this is this is all of us. It's one of our favorite interrogations of all times because it's executed well, sure. brilliantly. Everything from from top to bottom is is just it's just perfect. Uh, so let's start off with when he's building rapport. He does. He throws so much stuff in there. The part about the coffee right there, he's putting in the law of reciprocity, because what he's getting ready to say is, as we go, uh, when I, I have a thing, and I'm sure you're just like me, you treat everyone with, I treat everyone with respect, and I'm going to treat you with respect. And then he gives them the coffee as they're doing that. Oh, because later on, that's going to come into play. He's setting up all these things psychologically that are going to come back into play later on. Um, now, the table where he's sitting, a lot of times on, like on TV, you'll see someone sitting directly across the table from like here. I've got a little table here and you'd be sitting there and I'd be sitting here. That's that's one way of doing it. But the thing is, what you want to do, this guy's done perfectly. He set this guy sort of in the corner and he's at the at the corner of the table talking to him. So there's no table in the way, but he still has a table there to show that he's the guy in charge because the other guy doesn't the uh, the suspect doesn't have the table 
but the guy, but the interrogator does. So you at least get, he has his arm out and has all this stuff on it and you spread this stuff out. So it looks like there's a lot going on on there. So he's, he's, he's set that into play like Greg was saying earlier, and he's going to go through th- these things uh, one at a time. He's t- in other words, he's told him where to sit because when you walk in, the interrogator's chair is way over there and he walks him right there to where that chair is. So he just knows naturally where to sit down. So that's really great. Now, as we go through this, pay attention to the tone of voice of both of these guys. Number one, listen to the interrogator. What was his name? What would what, you say his name was? It's Jim, Jim Smith. Jim Smith. Yeah, DS Man. Jim Smith. Yeah, let me tell you something. So anyway, so listen to his tone of voice. It doesn't change. Just toward the end, it changes a little bit, and I'll explain why in a little while. But he comes in with the same tone of voice, and he looks like Michael from The Office, you know, on, on the TV show. He's not, but he comes on and he looks like an accountant, and his voice is just like you, you get the feeling. You don't get the feeling this guy's a detective. You don't get the feeling you're going to go to prison talking to this guy. You get the feeling you're going to talk about what you did this year in taxes. So as he goes along, listen to his tone of voice. It's so important because he's – He's completely setting this guy up, which we'll see at the end when all these things we're seeing here now will come back around and he'll use them at the end. I'll stop there. Chase, what do you got? Yep. Uh, agree with you guys so far. And uh, one of the things that we look for as interrogators is this rapid head movement in response to your voice. So he's looking the other way the interrogator starts talking and there's a jerk to look this rapid response uh, jerky responses and, and the quick movements is a way above baseline. And th- he's a colonel, but he's not a colonel in this room. And the interrogators made that very clear. Uh, so he's building authority and credibility with his uh, his clearance. And I call this gesture conformity when he's nodding quickly. There's the time between an ask and a, a nonverbal response is very quick, like less than a quarter of a second. Uh, so one the first things I teach people to start looking for in the interrogation room when you're going to have compliance or not is gesture conformity. Will Are there these little quick movements? And guilty people do this a lot more often than innocent people, a lot. But as far as the interrogator goes, he is doing exactly what he's supposed to do. He's building rapport, uh, talking about respect and gaining respect and lowering barriers. And he's starting to do another thing, which is understanding. You have to understand that person, their life circumstances. We're going to talk about that uh, uh, ad nauseum probably in a few minutes. I have no idea, but I, I'm sure we're going to get there. And it, we'll get to a point where we understand that person. And during the small talk that, that Greg was talking about a second ago, this is where we see the baseline. Are his hands crossing his body? No. Are his hands covering his genitals? No. He's very open. He gestures with his hand while he's talking. That's great. And when we get down to that understanding that person, that's when we as interrogators have to say things like, this isn't a big deal. Anybody could have done this under the same circumstances and those kinds of things. I'll leave it at that. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, Yeah, so first of all, to to Greg's point, who have we got in the room? Yes, we've got uh, DS, um, what did I say, Jim Smith. Fantastic job there. Uh, Yes, Colonel Russell Williams. So we might call him Colonel Russell Williams throughout this. and uh, He's not a colonel anymore. He is inside. Uh, His medals were struck. Uh, He is now not associated with the military service at all. In fact, all his uniforms were incinerated in the Trenton incinerator. So he has absolutely zero association anymore to the Canadian Armed Services. But at times we may refer to him as Colonel because it's important that we do. So you can see exactly what's happening here in terms of the lowering of power and how he's he's resisting by taking the power back. So uh, D.S. Smith says, um, calls him um, Russ and takes away that rank, gives him a short name. He instantly talks about another Russ in the police force that he was talking through. So he makes a link instantly, a social link with another Russ in the police force. 
instantly countermeasuring the loss of status there. And what you're going to get throughout this is this idea of losing control and gaining control. And in fact, what, what the colonel needs to do here is to make himself a very unattractive subject. The idea is, is that if you make yourself unattractive, that the interrogator would go off and find somebody else. It's like, this is too hard. Have we got somebody else? Because this is just annoying to do this. Can we swap this out? for a different one. So he's taking this tack of being unattractive. What uh, what the DS needs to do here is to create a sense of futility. Like it is now futile to try and get out of that. And he does that by the end. And we'll see this right at the end of that, how it becomes utterly futile trying to get out of this. But as it transpires at this moment, rank is taken away. He then tries to create a social link through this idea of Russ very skillful, ever been interviewed in a room like this, that's designed to lose control, to take control away from me. He says, no, no, I haven't, and smiles up at the, at the camera. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, and then he brings in NIS and top security clearance and, and, and brings back that winning back of status. So this, for me, is just this interplay of power going on here to work out who's going to be in control of this moment. To Scott's point of the, of the coffee there and using the coffee to win rapport, look what he does with that coffee. Okay, he asks, he asks, is it, is it, uh, is it black? Yeah, it's black with sugar. He then doesn't drink it. Okay, he's, he's taken the gift, but he's, he's having power by denying himself the gift of the coffee. He'll have the coffee when he wants to have the coffee. Somebody not resisting that interrogation would probably get straight into the coffee. Yeah, the guns may be a bad idea, but at least he's in control of that of that gum. At least that's something he can self-soothe with and actually create an experience uh, through his own control of that and control the coffee. So he's been pretty smart here. The unfortunate thing for him is he doesn't know what they have or what they're about to get. And also, I would suggest he's arrogant. And that arrogance, that feeling that he's better than D.S. Smith here is going to cause him a lot of problems down the line. So there, that's what I got for you. Yeah, so guys, two things. First, it's a compliance, the way he uses the coffee. It's a compliance training met method. He didn't offer him, hey, would you like some coffee with cream or sugar? Would you like some black coffee with sugar? That's a compliance thing. That's number one. Yeah, you can have anything you want as long as it's black. You know, that's, mm. that's Henry Ford 101. You can have any color you want as long as it's black. It's a compliance training thing. The second one, Mark, you just hit one of my favorite and hardest to get people capable of doing is the futility approach. The futility approach is one of the most powerful in all of interrogation. But people get to this point, they're like the Borg from some Star Trek show saying resistance is futile. And you want to just slap them on the head. It is a very subtle, very nuanced approach and wait and you'll see this guy in full. Hey, do you guys mind if I do the, the meeting thing very quickly? Just say how this works in no, meetings. No, dude. There yeah, you go, for it. Okay, cool. I'll run through it very quickly then. So I said you can use this in your daily life. And we said we start off with establish ID. Then we go to establish, or establish control. Then we go to establish ID. Establish rapport. Question. And we, if we walk that over to now your normal daily life, we would say in a meeting, you can establish identification because what we mean by that is who's in the meeting. We want to make sure everyone who's there belongs there and there's someone who was invited. If you have an opposing counsel and you don't know they're a lawyer, then you need to clear that up. Then we do something called an upfront contract. In that meeting, we say there's always somebody in control of a meeting. It's just a matter of whether you choose to take it. If you're in control, you say, hey, Chase, do I have an hour of your time? If the guy says yes, he's not going to get up when things get hot and when he gets upset. He's going to sit there through that hour and you're going to get to go through the things you want to do. Then you run through a list of ag agenda items. You take that list of agenda items and say, Chase, do you agree that one, two, three, four, five, and six are important? And if Chase says yes, then you say, okay, then we're good. And I might even say, Chase, are they in the right order? Are they in the right sequence? Is this the right list and in the right sequence? And once he says yes, now we have a contract. He's given me time. He's agreed to what I want to talk about. Guess what? I'm now in control of the entire environment. I can walk him through every one of those agenda items operating 
according to the plan we've agreed on. And if things get too confusing and too deep, I can say, hey, how about we park that until later? Or is that more important than everything else on the list? It's a powerful way of taking what we do in interrogation and using it in your daily life. So establishing identification, getting an upfront contract with a timeline, with agenda items you agree to in list and sequence, staying on the agenda and parking anything that doesn't work. It's something I use in everyday life in corporate America, and you can use it too. You just have to see Russ. The guy I was speaking with on whatever night that was was Russ as well. Oh yeah. And he took uh, took every number I had. Yeah. Now they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. Yeah, so. absolutely. It was All great. Right. Glad to see it. Uh, I'm just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone, just yeah. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a in a room like this before? Or? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh, no? Okay. No. Let's get this set up here. Well, I guess the closest to uh, interview by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh, yeah? All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, sure. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today. Okay. okay? Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you. Okay. okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a uh, a coffee guy or well, something. I, I didn't want to drink yeah. in front of you, so. No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely, are they black? Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. I um, definitely uh, take them out. I'll just throw them in there. I probably have it a little bit. Start your what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. Just a piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right, and again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe everybody with respect. I don't want to ask you to do the same for me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else. Excellent. Help. Okay, we good? Love, yeah. love it. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to uh, to talk to you about, okay? Mm -hmm. um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to, to Russell Williams, okay? Because mm -hmm. um, essentially, uh, there was a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, yeah, then I guess or, I drive past. Uh, yes, I, I would yeah. have to say there is a, a connection. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's why um, I'll be quite frank with you. That's why uh, things kind of um, uh, evolved when uh, the officers talked to you on Thursday night. Okay. Uh, we kind of went from there because uh, when I think you discussed with them the fact that you were a, uh, uh, a colonel yeah. uh, at the base. I was in uniform at the time, so. Yeah, so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Ms. Como um, yeah. was made. Okay, Chase, what do you got? We've got the interrogator going back to calling him Russell, which I just think was a just a slip. Every one of us has made mistakes way worse than that because it's, it's very uh, on the fly, this job. Uh, he's non-confrontational and explanatory. But we see Russ going into fig leaf mode already. The hands are kind of coming in front of the genitals. The interrogator copies some of this behavior, I think unconsciously, uh, because it was probably involved in training. He's done it so often in interrogations that it's, a, it's an unconscious thing. You never want any of these skills. If you're learning behavior profiling, you're learning how to read people, you don't want them to live behind your eyes. You want the skills out here where it's, it's a natural thing. The interrogator here is using lots of softening language in the statements. He's saying, I think, possibly, sort of, essentially. He says kind of three times and then finishes with an upward tone. 
So this is interesting that he establishes authority and then gains a little rapport, just pretending this is what I would call a Columbo method, where he's just figuring out, let me, I'm not really sure about a lot of this stuff. Can you confirm some of this for me? And I think that's uh, really what's going on here, but I I know exactly what, uh, what uh, Greg's going to say here. So uh, Greg, I'll pass it to you first. Yes, I'm, I'm going to leave a lot here, but I'm going to hit a few things. First thing he does is call out third party. Third party is the right way to go when you're trying to build rapport and trust. What he's really trying to do is to establish a new normal. What I always say is what we do best is we create a reason why you're allowed to do the wrong thing. If it's all confrontational, this is why I always say if you think confrontation is a way to interrogate, you're missing the boat. Mm. It's about trust. Once you get the person to a point that they trust you and they're bonded to you, it's hard as hell for them not to tell you the truth. And what this guy's doing very well is that he's calling out a third party that's going to become the bad guy, the booger man, the boogeyman, the guy out in the woods. So he first starts by saying they. You hear him use the word they. And he uses a lot of soft language, Chase. I love what he does with his soft pedaling. I'm also going to tell you that interrogators are kind of like swans. When they're good, they look elegant and floating nicely along the top of the water. But if you look under the water, their little feet are paddling like hell to keep them moving along. And I want you to start watching for mistakes he makes. I see them every time. He does great recovery, but you'll see his respiration increase and you'll see the interrogator starting to go (laughs) a little bit himself. He controls it very well, but pay attention. His mirroring, I'm with you, Chase. The mirroring is beautiful. He crosses his body. It becomes second nature. You interrogate 100 people, you'll get to where you know that when they do something, you do something. You'll change your cadence. His cadence has slowed already. He's trying to get this guy off of his high horse off of being a colonel and down to being a guy who's in trouble and he's talking slower, moving him more into that plane. And we call, in the old days, they would call it kinesthetic plane. You get a guy down to where he stop, his eyes drop down, left, down, right, down, left, down, right, just before you get to pre-confession. And you start that by talking lower and slower. Watch the colonel respond. Respiration is up. He's crossed his torso, put his hands in his crotch, just what you're saying, Chase. I call it the jaw rate or the or the chew rate. His chew rate is increasing like all hell now. And even more importantly, he's rolled his gum to between his front teeth and he's focusing on it. That's why I said it was a bad idea for him. When you're trying to resist interrogation, there's a lot of tricks you use and we teach a lot of them. What we never teach is how to interrogate. We teach how to resist interrogation. And when you know both, it's very interesting. I actually once had a very interesting line in Spin Magazine when they asked me if if being interrogated in SEER meant you knew how to interrogate. I'll leave that line there because it was provocative and you can go find it in Spin Magazine. I'll tell you guys what it is later. Um, He moves that gum to the front and he starts to chew like hell and he starts to nod. And when he's really affirming something, which is interesting, his nod rate's pretty quick because he's nervous and you see it. Chase, I agree, you see his head whip around to the interrogator already. It'll get more pronounced as we go, but this interrogator is setting him up for game of trust. He's moving him off of what he expects, where it's going to be the harsh interrogation he faced at resistance school to more of a soft sell and it's working. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so, To your point, Chase, yeah, I think confusion is being built up purposely here or or very well accidentally because uh, we get D.S. Smith, uh, first of all, talking about Russ, to Russ, then talking about Russell Williams in the third person, so disassociating there. I think that's a possibility of of setting up a Russell Williams that we can then ascribe uh, crimes to. Uh, We can put it put it down to Russell Williams as opposed to Russ, who I have in the room with me. So I think there may be a setup there of a possible out uh, on that. Maybe, maybe. Um, uh, But then he goes back to connecting you with the crimes. So we've now got Russ, who we like. We like Russ. Then we've got Russell Williams, who we're not sure about him. And then we've got the connection to you with the crimes. That's quite confusing. And I think that might be on on purpose because again, we're trying to we're trying to up this loss of control of, of who are we actually talking about right now. There's a lot of confusion there. Well, the head, the head does turn in there to give an ear, and there is this look of 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 maybe confusion, but I think it turns to criticism. And again, I think that is is Williams 
trying to be an unattractive subject. Who wants to interrogate somebody who is just quite critical of, of what you're coming up with? Like, what are, you, what are you talking about here? Again, I would suggest that's purposeful on his part of just trying to be critical, unattractive to be around. <laughs> However, um, what, we, what, we, what we do see as well, which I think is important to know, and you can use, in, in, in your own environment, when you're talking with people and you want to build rapport, is let's just go back to basic um, geometry. What you see is these two sitting in what we call in geometric terms, the complement to each other. If you've got one thing here and one thing there, that's called the complement. And so if you're interviewing somebody at the complement, it's more likely they'll fall into complementary behavior than if you place yourself in antagonism. In geometry, that's called antagonistic. Uh, it, it was Churchill who said, I think, we, you know, we make our places and then our places make us. And that's what happens when you sit up, set up a room for interview, interrogation, therapy, whatever you're doing, you're trying to set up the right geometry, first of all. That means it's most likely you're going to get the performance that you need, not only out of yourself, but out of your client or your subject. They have gone for, or, or it's been set up here in, in complement rather than antagonism. That would just cause more argument. Here's what I do. In a meeting where I want to build rapport really quickly, I go, hey, you know what? I haven't had a chance to get a cup, cup of coffee this morning. Would you, would you get up with me and let's just take a walk to go and grab a coffee? And then we move together in parallel. And it's in parallel as we walk along together, not looking at each other, but looking at what's going around. That's the point where I'll try and get information, rapport out of people, because there's so little conflict. Think about how bars are set up. So, so mainly guys can talk to each other in the main uh, and not fight. You sit them side by side and you get them looking at something else so they don't get into conflict. They don't look at each other, you know, with alcohol and get into conflict with each other. So think about how often can you get yourself into parallel with somebody rather than ever antagonism? Or if you can't do that, get into the compliment. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, let's talk about what uh, Greg brought up as well as the chew rate. And I forgot to hit that on the first one. As you know, I love gum. So on the first one, his <laughs> chew rate was 60 times a minute. That was the average, averaging it out like, like you do a blink rate, Chase. So I averaged it 60 times a minute. That's 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 pretty good clip there. He's coming in, he's a little bit nervous. He hadn't done this before, so but he knows he's done it. So he doesn't know he doesn't know if he's gonna get in trouble or not, but he knows he's guilty. So his his chew rate's at 60 there. Now, when we get to this this question where he says, uh, the thing where he says you hit the nail on the head, um, then it goes up to, then we're down to 42 a minute, 42 choose a minute. That's when he talks about that. Then when he says, um, that we, we're, let's talk about the issues that make us want to talk to Russell Williams. That's when it goes to, he has 14 and 11 seconds. That's a lot. 14 chews, 11 seconds. I'm a professional gum chewer. That's a lot. I can tell you that right now. It's coming out of the gate. That's a whole lot. You guys covered all the, uh, his hands and all that. One thing that I, that I noticed, and I heard this from this, uh, who does all who talked about it almost the very same way I did is this British guy wrote a bunch of books. What's that? What's a uh, long haired dude? What's his name? Blonde haired guy. <laughs> TEDx talk has like a gazillion views. British guy. I can't remember his name. Bowden. Uh, is it Bowden? Mark Bowden. That's who it is. <laughs> the same thing. If you'll watch this guy, what he does is he turns his ear toward him when they get, when the, when the, uh, suspect when russell's talking he's got his ear toward him now there's a thing that i like to do for years and years and this is how I, I i picked this up or when i saw mark doing this on a tv show somewhere i was like oh gosh he knows if you're talking to someone and you want them to listen and you got a lot to say you don't want to say anything this is what i found that helps as you're talking to that person when you're listening to them your ears are your ears kind of like to the, you're pointing toward him you're listening to him okay great and usually your illustrators these are the things that that we know are when you your brain is emphasizing specific words and phrases like I did just then. Those are illustrators. Instead of your illustrators going out when you're talking to this person, what you want to do is give their brain the impression that they're the ones talking and you're the ones listening. So you get your head going like this a little bit and you shake your head up and down a little bit as you're saying something. And then you sort of, instead of making your illustrators go outward, you bring them in this way a little bit, almost like you're dragging information out of them as you're talking. 
You don't make a whole big thing about it, but you do very subtly as you're talking to them. And you do a couple of pauses like that. And the next thing you know, when you're shaking your head and you're doing this, they'll be shaking their head and listening. And theoretically, their brain is under the impression they're the ones talking and you're the one listening. So they're not thinking about something else to uh, talk about next, what's going to come up next. However, in this case, Russell Williams' brain is just flying around in there everywhere. You can tell by how still he is and how tight he gets and how loose he gets. His breathing right here is 18 times a, a minute. It's not not a whole lot at this point. That's not a whole lot. 18 times a minute isn't a whole lot. So, he, but but he's he's practiced that. He knows to do to to to, to keep his breathing under control. So, it's, as his brain's flying around, he's trying to think what's going to come next. How much trouble am I in? And he's almost. This is when we see things start to come together. This is when we, from this moment on, we start. We see his approach is going to go from when Greg was talking about him bobbing his head up and down. When he hits that point where he says, um, let's talk about the connection uh, with you and Miss Cuomo or how that was made. That's the deepest head nod. It's almost a pre-confession nod where he goes down and he guards that neck with his, with his chin. Because other times he's doing this, it's pretty big. But when that phrase hits, man, that thing goes all the way down and stays for a second and comes back up. That's a warning. What are you going to say, Greg? You're moving. Yeah, no, no. I just moved to correct. Oh, okay. Actually. I thought you had something to add to it. Sorry, man. <laughs> but I do have something I to like, add. Yeah. I, I do have something to add when you're done. I'll, oh, I'll no, I'm done. Go ahead. Go ahead. What do you got? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the last one for me, I said, you shouldn't call him by his title. He's doing it here intentionally. He's setting it up for pride and ego up, pride and ego down later. Yeah. And what you do is you call him out. You say, hey, you are a colonel. So later when you can say, hey, what kind of scumbag colonel does this? Then you can get him. Because remember, when you get a person off balance, you get them out of the thinking brain. What you'll see is when we, we always know when we're about to get a confession because you get them in their brain case. Once they're in their brain case and there's no outside world existing, you're the only voice they hear. And they entirely forget there's a camera and a microphone because that all the only space they're existing in is in that kinesthetic plane and they're down in just turmoil. They're like a squirrel in the road trying to figure out where to go next. And we just reach over and go, it's okay, Bob. We're going to help you. Now, again, professional liars that we are, we're going to help you right into jail. But that's what we do. So here we go. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to uh, to talk to you about. Okay, um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us, mm -hmm. and um, you know you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to to Russell Williams. Okay, because mm -hmm. um, essentially uh, there is a, a a connection um, between you and uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, and then I guess or, I drive past. Uh, yes, I, I would yes. have to say there's a, a connection. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's why um, I'll be quite frank with you. That's why uh, things kind of um, uh, evolved when uh, the officers talked to you on Thursday night. Okay. Uh, we kind of went from there because uh, when I think you discussed with them the fact that you were a uh, uh, a colonel yeah. uh, at the base. I was in uniform at the time, so. Yeah, so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Miss Como um, yeah. was made. Okay, I'm good. You guys good? Yeah. All right, let's move. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie Franz uh, Como. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you found out? I uh, do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, Well, as soon as the uh, the off staff and the base learned, they told me. Okay. So I got an email. I can't remember if it was late at night or early in the morning. It was certainly I saw it. Uh, I want to say first thing in the morning because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for um, um, a set of meetings on one of the days. I can't remember what what day of the week we're talking about, but uh, yeah, no, I mean. Obviously, when your people get skilled, it uh, gets your attention. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I very much remember that coming in. And how did you know Marie Franz Coleman? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. So uh, I can't even remember. I think it was a one day trip. Uh, I did a, a number of trips uh, in Canada transporting um, our um, you know, troops, sort of first leg out of Edmonton. Uh, you know, we tend to hopscotch them across uh, until they get in the theater. So, uh, anyway, I, I can't remember which trip it was, but uh, we did a number of them out to Edmonton just to, to pick up the troops, bring them to Trenton, 
and then uh, put a fresh crew on and because uh, we fly out and back in the same day so pushing the edge of that and uh, fresh crew on and continue on after a couple hour delay okay all right mark what do you got yeah um so look, one one thing that really interests me is that heavy sigh in there what i would be interested in around that is 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 that something he is performing in order to try and get an idea of emotional connection to the victim or is it a heavy sigh around something else a release of the tension that's going on there or is he using that moment to release tension at a place where it would feel normal to do that because we're talking about the news of the death of a of a colleague, although, you know, his whole assertion is he didn't really know this person anyway. So I'm going to go for he's using it. It's he's using it to release tension. We're starting to see the build up in, in him of the tension here due to the duress of this. And he does need to release something at that point. Remember, what's happening is you've got a build up of uh, as you get fight and flight. You've got a build up of lactic acid and you need to burn that off. And so you got to emit carbon dioxide. So you've got to sigh out. You've got to get that stuff out. It's just part of respiration. Um, look, here's what happens is lots of detail around this this stuff he suddenly goes into detail around ottawa well that's a a play for status ottawa is canada's um uh, ruling capital it's the political capital it's where uh the government of canada have all their high offices including uh the the uh, armed forces so he's he's making a play for hey i was in ottawa very important very important trip to ottawa but then he goes into a whole kind of seductive story about exactly how you move uh troops i guess when they come into the the uh east coast uh back from afghanistan into europe onto the east coast you know now i'm getting them back to alberta across uh canada it's like we don't really need that kind of detail. Well, what you're trying to do, again, is up your status around this. DS Smith, brilliant, just goes, okay. So I don't want to, I don't care about that. Okay, not, not of interest to me. So again, immediately crushes that, that status there. So um, William's trying to make himself unattractive by being too important. Uh, Smith there strikes him down on that. But what is interesting for me is we see, I think it's hard to see because because we're only really seeing the arm, but I think we're probably starting to see a few more illustrators on that story. So he's being a bit more um, verbose with his body language on that, which means we're probably getting a baseline of here's what he's like when he's telling us the truth. When he's telling us the, the truth of here's how you move troops across Canada, we're going to get a lot more movement from him. When he's not, when he's trying to hold stuff back, he's going to lock himself right down. So that's what I got on that one. Uh, Chase, what do you got for us? Yeah, absolutely agree. That was a fantastic point about uh, bringing up Ontario there. And I think his eyebrows start to stick upward in this request for approval uh, about just a few seconds into this and his gum chewing here we can see it start to increase his chew rate uh, goes up a little bit and one of and when he says one of your people gets killed it gets your attention or I'm paraphrasing you can see him tighten his his cross body grip that he's reaching across his body with with a, a single arm and I, I think this confirmation glance continues throughout to the end of the video. He maintains his eye contact to ensure that he's still on solid ground with the interrogator. So we see him continuing to look back during anything that might be questionable to, to check for the response of the interrogator. And this, uh, this grip that he's, he's grabbing his other arm continues while he's speaking and he's reluctant to use his hand. And this is this is the source of internal security for right now. This this grip across his body, and he's using flying the troops obviously with the eyebrow flash to say, yeah, how how impressive is that?" He's building a little more credibility uh, with the interrogator, and I'll leave it at that. I'll keep it short. Uh, Scott, all right. 
when he says, uh, let's talk about his chew rate again. So when he, st- when he says, uh, how did you know Marie Cuomo? He, he says, I only met her once. And he says it really loud. It's like his brain is saying, no, man, we only met her the one time. We got we to gotta get that out. At that point, his chew rate blows up to 96 times a minute. That's a lot. That's a whole lot. Um, <laughs> then, like Chase was talking about, his arm moves up and starts. starts uh, that's, his, that's where his adapters start kicking in. He's been using his gum as, a, as an adapter up to that point, trying to blow off some of that built up stress or tension and trying to, and trying to, to be cool and, and relax himself. But that's when we start seeing that. Then we interrogate at the same time. He's using the, he's got the same posture. He's got the same tone. Everything's just the same. Whereas we're slowly starting to see uh, Russell Williams getting into the, He's starting to get wound up, man, because his brain at this point is just flying in there because he's, he's starting to get worried. Um, he takes a deep breath, I think, to sort of control his breathing. Try to, you know, as he gets relaxed. So, because his breathing rate is pretty heavy, it, it, it gets it, it jacks up in there. I don't have it written down on here. I thought I had it. Um, but his, his um, illustrators, they stay pretty small at this point because when he came in before, he was doing a little bit. We'll see him get big in a couple of minutes, a little bit bigger. But usually, when someone is worried and they're being a little bit deceptive, you'll see those illustrated. That's one of the things you, you that I personally look for if I'm trying to decide whether this person is being honest or not or they're making something up watch those those illustrators if they get smaller they disappear when they've been doing this the whole time watch out for that it's really really important um yeah so you guys clean me out on that one a lot of it greg what do you got yeah so i'm gonna go in reverse order because i agree mark you're dead on we get a baseline when he starts talking about this whole baseline thing he's you see him illustrating hmm big mistake big 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 mistake it's a reason the interrogator allows him to talk because now he can compare it to something the interrogator does an artful question how did you know not hey did you know not hey tell me about boom how did you know that causes a guy to tell you something now here's what i think the big respiration is i think if you look at him when he's talking about let me go back when you look at him when he's doing his baseline his face is kind of slack you know his muscles are relaxed there's not a lot of this wrenched face that you see when he's under duress when he first starts and he asks how did you know his head is up request for approval he's got concrete face here like that demon from japan Mm -hmm. you were talking about one time mark i forget the name of the one yeah really rigid face really rigid face his nodding is more intense his barriers are up his internal conversation is going 90 to nothing and he has a respiration exhale The reason he does that, in my opinion, is because he's hit something he's prepared for, and that's chaff and redirect. And you watch that adapter in sacred space disappears a little and his hands start to move because now he gets to talk about that he doesn't have to think about. It's real fact. He's chaffing and redirecting and hoping you'll bite into, hey, how do you fly that plane? I'm surprised he didn't say, I flew Her Majesty, because he did. And I could imagine him saying something like that because this is his chance to get away. Then when he asks, how did you know, when he says the part about how did you know her and he says she was on a crew, I only met her once, she was on a crew, tongue jut. Mm, distasteful subject. Now, it could be accidental because he just, you know, had an exasperated breathe. But I'm thinking, no, it's more, okay, that's a real tongue jut in the Desmond Morris distasteful one it out of my mouth kind of thing. Then he goes back into that normal baseline. This interrogator is just sitting going, waiting for a bite, and he, he'll get it in a bit. Fantastic job. If you're listening to us, we would love to have you on our show. Come and see us. Yeah, no kidding. That's all I got. That'd be great. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie Franz uh, called yeah. um, Do you remember how you found out? I uh, do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, Well, as soon as the uh, the off staff and the base learned, they told me. Okay. So I got an email. I can't remember if it was late at night, early in the morning. It was certainly I saw it. Uh, I want to say first thing in the morning because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for um, um, a set of meetings on one of the days. I can't remember what what day of the week we're talking about, but uh, yeah, no, I mean. Obviously, when your people get skilled, it uh, gets your attention. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I very much remember that coming in. And how did you know Marie Franz Coleman? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. 
So uh, I can't even remember. I think it was a one-day trip. Uh, I did a, a number of trips uh, in Canada transporting um, our um, you know troops sort of first leg out of Edmonton. Uh, you know, we tend to hopscotch them across uh, until they get in the theater. So uh, anyway, I, I can't remember which trip it was, but uh, we did a number of them out to Edmonton just to, to pick up the troops, bring them to Trenton, and then uh, put a fresh crew on, and because uh, we fly them back in the same day, so pushing the edge of that, and uh, fresh crew on, and then continue on after a couple hour delay. Okay. All right. Ready? Yeah. So that particular week, uh, do you have any recollection? Well, for instance, when you got the email, uh, yeah. Do you remember where you were? I was at home in Tweed. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember if that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton, or had you flown? No, I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa earlier in the week uh, for some meetings over in uh, in Gatineau for one of the. Um, it's actually for the C-17 acquisition. I was project director and when I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow-up stuff for that. Okay. So I had been here um, at some point in that week. Again, I can't remember how the days all fell together, but um, I seem to remember that I got this word shortly after having come back from Ottawa. It seems to me it was the same week. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I told you before, we look like swans until you see our feet under the water. Watch him. Watch the interrogator. He does something with his hands, and he's keenly observant of his own body language and kind of moves glitchy because he's afraid that it'll be perceived by the other guy. That's the curse of being us, right? And we're sitting across the table. We're like, oh, yeah, he might understand that. And we do something glitchy to move it around. So it's an interesting turn. He does it again. This interrogator knows what he's doing. He uses leading questions. Did, will, have, or can. Those words allow you to cut short a conversation and redirect it. He does a masterful job of asking in that way. Now, watch the feigned misunderstanding of the of Williams. I'm going to stop calling him a colonel, and I'm really proud of them for burning his uniforms. That says something about the Canadian mm -hmm. military. Dishonor goes in the furnace with everything else. Um, so he turns away. And he barriers a little more. And then his chew rate increases and his barriering and adapting. When we say adapting and barriering, barriering is I need space. I'm putting something between me and you. Um, adapters are ways of releasing nervous energy, whatever it may be. And he's doing both. And I call that sacred space. And he shrinks a little as he gets into this. He's making the target smaller, it's psychological all in it. And then he bumps up at say, when he says, he looks like he's comfortable until he says, were you at home all the time? And then suddenly he's like, oh. Oh, now I got to tell the truth and I'm going to have to say, no, I was in Ottawa and I was here. I was in a place I shouldn't have been. Then his barriers increase, but he makes more eye contact and he starts to chaff and redirect and resume statement to use Chase's term again with a C-17 project leader. So I seem important. Now, here's where everything's starting to unravel to me. There's a new word we've not heard from him yet. I seem to remember. Now he's getting plausible deniability. He's starting down that path of, well, I seem to remember, not I remember. So he's hedging, he's distancing, and he's giving this opportunity to create reasonable doubt as to whether he was there or not. Now, the other thing is this interrogator is using very specific language. Do you remember? That's intentional. That's very intentional. Now, I will also leave it at that because I don't want to step into something I shouldn't, and I'll push that over to Scott. I know it's you killing you. I know it's killing it you. It is killing me. It is killing me. All right. Me. <laughs> <I know. laughs> All right. Well, uh, this cheer rate actually goes to 90 here. That's pretty good. That's, that's, a, that's a whole lot. So when he says, I've been in Ottawa, he says it twice. And then he starts to make that big, ad, that big adapting move. Man, he's so uncomfortable. And we actually see a micro expression here when he says, uh, for some meetings, I was over in, in Gatineau. I don't know what Gatineau is. Anybody know what Gatineau is? I'll tell you. What is it? Yeah, it's 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 specifically the part of Ottawa where the government offices are for the services. Okay. So he's being very very specific about I was at government meetings in in Gatineau. Okay, the Pentagon now, that, and U.S. speak right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's where we see that little that contempt that no, that thing on the side of his nose goes up right there side of his face. So he's either. That had a bad, hard time there in, at Gat in Gatineau, or he wasn't there, and he's making that up at the same time. I think that's what you said, Greg. Um, so, so we see that, and then let's start noticing how far apart they are, the distance between uh, the, uh, Smith 
and Williams. Let's start looking at the distance of that because that changes drastically here in a little while as we get to going. Uh, again, he, his brain, he's starting to think and he's starting to move around a little bit. He's trying to keep that in control, but he's having a real problem with it. Uh, Greg ate up two or three of mine, so I'm going to move on. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so as a, as a postmodernist, I have something very meta coming up. So hang hang in there. Uh, so uh, w- what we get, what I want you to pay attention to is you can read all the books you like on body language about this and that, and there's the other and this and that. Just look out for the significant change that you see in him on this significant. When I talk about, is there a significant change? This is the kind of thing that I'm looking at. Okay. It's very significant. Now, what does it mean? I don't know. But it happens on that area of, I had been in Ottawa. Significant change there. And just as Scott says there, that look of disgust on Gatineau. I don't see why him at that kind of rang, you know, to turn up, when you turn up to Gatineau, that's a cool thing. That's good. It means you've made it. Yeah, I'm, I know you might be getting all kinds of problems from your peers and, and and higher ranks there. I know there's all that, and it's it's hellish to get out there, and it's you know it doesn't look great, okay, especially in the winter. But it's a good thing to be there. So I think the um, the disdain or the disgust there is around about he's smelling his own lie. He's making this one up on the fly, and it smells really bad to him okay now here here's the meta piece here is the piece of here is the where we disappear into a beautiful tautology which is he starts talking about to raise his rank the c17 okay and if you don't know c17 it's a big big uh plane that can shift lots and lots of stuff it'll cost you about 350 million dollars super expensive so if you're put in charge of the acquisition of that and this one particularly is being moved to going over to trenton where it's going to be uh be flying out of that's a big thing now and and look how he gets into that story we've gone from so where were you into a story of i'm buying a 350 million dollar plane and just so you know that 350 million dollar plane has its own countermeasure dispensing system and that's what we call chaff and redirect and that's exactly what's happening here there i'll leave it at that chase what do you got i'll go about full circle (laughs) <laughs> that was beautiful, that was Mark. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was good. Oh, we've so all I, we've all been. No, no, Chase, Chase, Chase. Yeah, I think the interrogator's non-confrontational. He's able to let him talk without interruption, which is uncommon for interrogators. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the things I actually teach is this mouth covering thing that he's doing it signals unconsciously to the other person that you're not going to speak, that you're making a decision not to speak and makes them more likely to continue talking. So uh, William says, you know, I'd been in Ottawa. There's the immediate arm cross. There's grip. There's digital flexion. His fingers are, are squeezing into his arm. They're not relaxed. That's one of the things I always say, if you're looking at someone with their arms crossed, that's meaningless. It's meaningless. Somebody says they're being defensive, closed off, withholding, concealing. None of those things apply to that. But one thing to pay attention to is the fingers. Are they squeezing the arm? Are they relaxed? Are they comfortable? Are the palms touching the body where a person's hugging themselves for reassurance? Those things matter. The arm crossed by itself is not not a big deal. So uh, I think this statement puts him in the area of the crime or, or lets him know that he's internally being deceptive. So this shows he has knowledge of something going on. We see this shift. If there's one thing, if I could, if you paid me whatever for a class in body language that lasted 30 seconds, I would say the entire purpose of reading human behavior is detecting changes in past observed comfortable behavior. Class over. And that's all I got. Yeah, you guys both just hit, and we should bring this up at every show. The difference in us and absolutist is what you just heard. All of us are looking for change. And what we see in other people is this means X. No, that doesn't mean X. It means my nose itches. (laughs) 
Yeah. Joan of Arc calls it the differences, looking for the differences in comfort and discomfort. Very yep. simple, right Right to the point. All right. So that particular week, uh, do you have any recollection? Well, for instance, when you got the email, uh, yeah. do you remember where you were? I was at home in Tweed. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember if that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton, or had you flown? No, away? I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa early in the week uh, for some meetings over in, uh, in Gatineau for one of the... Um, actually for the C-17 acquisition. I was project director when I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow-up stuff for that. Okay. So I had been here um, at some point in that week, again, I can't remember how the days all fell together, but um, I seem to remember that I got this word shortly after having come back from Ottawa. It seems to me it was the same week. We good? Yeah. Yep. So if we were to, uh, to you know, do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there, is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, Absolutely. did this? No. Okay. It'll be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right. Because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it... Uh, um, uh, you, you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in our investigation, right? Okay. All right, I'll go first on this one. This is, is this is another setup for this is a bait question, uh, but he's setting him up for the biggie, which comes up next, because he's he's planting that thing in his mind. Is there anything I didn't think about? If there's if anyone's going to say anything bad about me, he's not ready for the next one, which we'll get into in a minute. So that's that's great. He's sort of setting him up for that. We see him start to squirm a little bit and start to think about what's happening. Um, and we can see that that brain is in there just flipping out, man. He's in there. It's bouncing around in there. Now, um, we we know that because we start seeing his face and his forehead start getting flush. Up to this point, it's been it's been fairly normal, flesh-wise. But now it's starting to get a little bit red because he's thinking he's heating up. He's starting to feel the heat come on. And he's wondering, what do these cats know? What's going, you know, uh, this isn't good. This isn't good now because he's realizing that that he's probably in trouble at this point, I think. His breathing rate goes up to 24 times a minute. That's a whole lot in, in, in a minute. So um, now it's so, let's see what else. But then again, the, the uh, Smith keeps it light by laughing and doing those types of things. And when he says, um, when you ask him that bit, the bait question, we ask that, we see just a little bit of a really quick flash smile as, he's, as the second part of it goes really, really quickly. That tells us as well, he's thinking that he should be smiling about that, but he just busts out and then goes away really quick, really quickly. Um, what else have I got on here? Yeah, he's just letting him know that there's there's a lot more, there's a lot more coming and he's getting ready for it. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yes, we see... Uh... He says, you know, is there anything somebody might have misinterpreted? He's he's setting up the frame or the perception from the very beginning. And I think this is beautiful. Uh, I, I would add on here, if I was teaching a course, of course, we could always do everything a little better, a little differently. But it's good to set up this question with something like, I'm, I'm glad you're here. You know, we've got 76 officers canvassing the neighborhoods talking. We've already, we've already spoken to 97 people just since yesterday morning. And then the question comes in to, to build credibility into the bait question. So I always like, I always like to establish a little bit of credibility inside the bait question. Uh, and, and if you watch the Dr. Phil episode, we were on Scott, Greg, and Mark uh, past a person down to me and for me to use a bait question followed by what we call a mind virus. Uh, but we don't have time for that tonight. So next, uh, the, the follow-up with uh, the interrogators appeal to the man's intelligence need is a chef's kiss. Beautiful moment. I love watching that. And it, it's kind of just one final chance to tell you, tell us, uh, what do you think somebody might have said? This is, this is it. I mean, this is the final chance. And that is a powerful tool with guilty people. And you'll see guilty and innocent people respond to this in completely different ways. 
That's the power of a bait question. It's not a leading question. And it's not a question that assumes facts, not an evidence, or it doesn't assume facts. We're not lying to anyone. We're asking if there's any reason. We'll see a few more bait questions throughout here tonight. And uh, I, I think the interrogator is doing a wonderful job so far here. So, uh, Mark. Yeah, yeah. What I love about D.S. Smith is is he plays his weakest cards first. And and so we do see that he doesn't really out of this first bait question. I mean, I think it, it, it sets up futility. It works towards futility of the situation, but it maybe doesn't get... Uh, the information that might have been more useful. And so we do see a difference in in Smith's body language there. I think there is a touch of disappointment that he doesn't get, you know, more information out of him uh, because um, Williams, his countermeasure here to be unattractive to the interrogator is, I'm very boring. And the idea would be is that then D.S. Smith goes, oh, yeah. Um, hey, lads, have we, got, have we got a more interesting one to bring in? Because this one is, is very, very boring. He's hoping to make himself super unattractive, super uninteresting. So this kind of goes over and we might swap him out for somebody better. Of course, that isn't going to happen here because uh, he's, he's the option that they have right now and maybe even at this point as well i'm not quite sure when they get the shoe print from him i've been through the videos that we looked at not the whole thing and i can't see where his shoes leave him uh, but at some point his 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 boots he gives over his did, boots i think they did that before they started oh they did it before they start so they've literally they brought him in and said can we have a look at your boots yeah. as you yeah. walk in by the way uh taking somebody's shoes one of the best ways to reduce their status. One of the best ways. If you've ever been to a British football match where the police are expecting crowd violence, one of the things that the police will do is say, yeah, lads, give us your shoes before you go in. And you'll go in barefoot so that they know that way less is going to kick off. Not only is it hard to fight in bare feet and not get yourself damaged, but you don't, you don't feel safe. Uh, so it's a great, a great reduction of status by taking people's shoes. So he goes for the unattractiveness. I'm very, very boring. But then what uh, D.S. Smith does is to bring in this idea of we don't want any surprises. OK, surprises would be bad. And again, that's building the futility of it. The more surprises you give me, the worse it's going to get for us here so give over the information but anyway first bait bait question oh by the way i think the bait question always also has disassociation in it i've certainly got that in my notes but i can't remember how it's done so why not go back and look at that for me and put below how that bait question also has disassociation in it so it might not be somebody could kind of give you information which is applied to a version of you something distant from you not actually you in the room with me right now uh, that's what i got on that one greg what do you got for me yeah so guys i'm gonna try not to be long-winded here because i'm about to go into the mechanics of interrogation we're going to talk about how this works how an interrogation actually works so we talked about approaches. Approaches are these levers, these psychological ploys we use to get in someone's head. And those include things like, I'll list a handful of them and then we'll go from there. Direct, people ask a question, you answer it or you don't. Incentive, I offer you something, you give it to me. People have given me information for cookie or ice cream before. It just works that way. Sometimes it's alcohol or something else. Emotional, that means, that means love or hate of something. Fear, up and down. And that can be harsh or, or it can be aggressive. Pride and ego, up or down. Um, let me see if I can even uh, repetition, establish ID, all of these things come together. And then futility, rapid fire, all silence. All of those are approaches and ways to get you to talk. What you're seeing here is a very artful beginning. Now, if he stumbled into it, fantastic, but I don't think so. I think what he's doing with this pseudo bait question is he is establishing we know all like that. He said, hey, you had this security interview is there anything in there people might misunderstand that's that is a shot across the bow for hey i've seen your security interview i know a lot of stuff about you that is not public knowledge it's already starting down that path and it's very subtle but it's the first step now imagine i start bringing in the mechanics of this and what he's after is a reaction does he get a reaction 
go back and watch the video and turn the sound off. Watch him because he starts with that blink rate up. His legs are crossed. He throws that forehead up as he trying to, you know, he says this whole thing about it'd be very boring and his legs open. His legs blossom wide open in kind of a cocky leg position after. Does it mean he's being cocky? It means something changed. Ding, ding, ding. What an orchestration is, we talk about these 14 approaches. None of them work in a vacuum. The only one that works in a vacuum is direct. Hey, Chase, did you do this? Well, yeah, Greg, I did it. That's a direct. But the rest of them, we we feather them together and we create this beautiful story that allows you to be the hero. If the hero is telling us where the body is or something else, all these approaches go together. Here comes this. There's an incentive. There's a carrot dangle going on right now while he's talking. And that's I'm trying to allow you to save face. He's starting those two approaches right now. This is masterful. And we're going to see later one of the single best sentences I've ever heard an interrogator deliver. So this is interrogation geeking for me because I've taught it for so many years. I just love watching it. Thanks. You need to calm down, Greg. You're getting too into it, man. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'll geek on this one because this is masterful. Nobody's going to watch this anyway. So if we were to, uh, to you know, do a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there, is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say, Russell Williams uh, Absolutely. did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right. Because and essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it? Uh, um, I th you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in our investigation, right? So, Russell, um, is there anything you can think of? Let's go talk about Marie France Como for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. Is there any reason at all you can think of that during our investigation, obviously we're searching uh, computers, uh, uh, things like Blackberries, right? Mm -hmm. Electronic devices, uh, looking through houses for things that are in handwriting, written notes, diaries, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the content was, but is there any reason at all you can think of why Marie France Como would have specifically referenced you in some of her, uh, in some of her writings? Not at all. No? No, absolutely not. Okay. Is there anything that she ever said to you that led you to believe that there might be something uh, more than a passing interest with her towards you? Not at all. No, we spent... You know, one flight together talking, I'd go back occasionally and talk. No, I, I, if that's the case, that's it. That's very surprising. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So another bait question. He's he's uh, building on the last one. You know, there could be a sense there of Williams thinks, great, if that's the best bait question that you have, you know, I got through that one. Well, here comes another one. And it has a couple of kind of non sequiturs in it or, or what we might call nested loops, kind of interruptions in the pattern there. So that, look, really logically, if you went into that base que bait question, all you'd come out with is like, yeah, you don't have anything, do you? You just don't have anything. Because that's what, when you put those words together that DC Smith says, it basically says, they actually don't have anything, but, you know, could it be possible that there is something? Well, he's in a place right now where he's not really able to undo that because we do see him uh, take that bait and we do see him lean forward, lean in, you know, look for that. He is going, what the, What have they got? So he thinks they have something. He isn't cognitively um, able at that point to deconstruct that question for what it is, which is they don't have anything, uh, no written material in anybody's diaries or anything, you know, that references him. Uh, anyway, so he comes in though still because he sees he is pretty good. He comes in with a strong denial. No, not at all. But his head reels back right in there. And then here for me is the significant change. No, absolutely not. And I want you to go and listen to that tone of voice. 
are no, absolutely not. And that's the biggest thing in there. So, yeah, uh, the DS does not get uh, a, a big spiel of confession from him. I don't know whether he's expecting that. I think probably not. You know, he's on a build up. Of, of the futility of this, but he does get a nice reaction and a nice tonal change out of him on that on that build there. Chase, what do you have for me? One thing that I tell everybody in our interrogation courses to purchase and bring with you in your briefcase, because we, you know, a lot of these uh, interrogators are carrying these pocket recorders for their own recordings, which is on the table there, is a washcloth. They come in handy. Big time. They absorb a lot of sound in the room. They just pick up voice. Washcloths are extremely effective. And so what we're doing here or what we're seeing here in this interrogation is a we're starting a, tr a potential transition from what we call an interview to what we call an interrogation. So right now we're still kind of in this phase that if you're depends on what technique you're looking at, but this is the interview phase. We're asking a series of very, very pointed questions, one of which is the bait question, to determine whether or not we think there is a high or low likelihood that this person is guilty. And that's what we're seeing here. So once the interrogator determines this person's probably guilty, then we go from interview mode to interrogation mode. And that all starts with a confrontation, which we're going to hear in a little bit. And anytime we're saying, is there any reason, it's not a leading question. So he provides a list of potential evidence like we just talked about before. He says, we're doing this. We're searching computers and Blackberries. He's listing all of the things. But what he's actually doing is instructing William's mind exactly what to worry about. So all the things he wouldn't have worried about otherwise, he's telling him specifically what he needs to start worrying about before the question comes out. And I think he, this is, bait question is walking a little bit of a uh, thin line between saying there is something and there isn't, but I think he's still on the right side for sure. But I think the interest level of a suspect in whether or not they want to discover more. They want to learn what you have and what's going on before they answer. So they're holding back before they answer. This is a guilty behavior. doesn't mean guilt. It suggests guilt. And we see this again confirmed with speaking in fragments. The movement is sped up with these jerky, responsive movements and this stress behavior. His arms haven't moved. He's still locked in place. Greg. Yeah, I think one of the things you just hit is key. A person who is being accused of something is not going to be interested in the case. They're going to be interested in getting the hell out of there. The more interest they show in the case, the more liable they are to wanting to know what it is you have. And I think that's a great call out, Chase. In terms of the bait question, you're right. It's not a leading question. It's a poke. It's a it's a prod. It's a look to see. It's a start to do a we know all approach. It's start to say, look, we got stuff you don't know about and we're going to share it with you slowly and I'm going to slowly choke you. That's the way it goes. Because he's got no gum, remember I said in the beginning, big mistake to start off with gum, all the energy is going to go somewhere because your energy level is going to increase when you come into an interrogation, not decrease. Now, you might just get worn out, but trust me, after having done a 14-hour interrogation, you don't get the opportunity to get worn out because we keep poking and prodding and making your head turn up, you have fight or flight. So he does a deep swallow, his jaw clenches instead of milling, and when he does that thing, Mark, where he does that... I'm, I'm not sure I understand that fake glance and that fake disbelief. Chase, or, or Scott, you talk about this all the time. That fake disbelief is gone in a microsecond. It doesn't look real. If you accuse me of something, I'd be like, what? Not gone that quickly. So good indicator. It means something. Remember, he should have kept his legs in front of him. Now his feet are under his chair and he's leaning forward. He's all bunched up. All that baseline has shifted from when he was denying things in the beginning. When he said none at all, he made way too much eye contact like he was trying to hypnotize. He said, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Nervous laugh. Really? Really? You're going to do that sitting in front of this guy? And the guy catches it, I guarantee you. Then he goes, no, not at all. He has a lilt and his entire demeanor shifts and he does that little shoulder to shoulder head bobble thing. One of the best parts of this entire thing is, in my opinion, this guy just took the biggest, boldest step possible. When he said, or maybe she said to you, hmm, that's bold, because if you never talked to her, you would say, I never talked to her. 
and you would never think anything of it because you would do that. However, what happens to Williams? He falls for it and says, no, we talked about this. We went in the, I went to the back of the plane twice and talked to her. OK, that's an old interrogation trick I used to teach people all the time. If you go through basic interrogator course, they'll teach you ask every question. Are you married? What is your wife's name? Well, that's dumb because the human brain finds patterns. And if I say, tell me your wife's name, tell me your child's name, tell me your oldest son's name, your brain starts to think I know all that. And that's what he's doing here. This is powerful. He's he's continuing that we know all with this bait question, too. And he's driving a powerful a powerful message that we know more than you think we do and just wait we'll show you that bait question is powerful scott what do you got all right um well you see his breathing rate his breathing rate goes it gets pretty shallow here it starts uh, jacking down some but for me i think this was the bait question i thought this was great because the way he sets this up not only does he start mm -hmm. asking the question he puts him on notice that that's coming but then he waits and while he's waiting and talking about this other part of the question, boy, that brain starts blowing up and he starts creating this world in there of all this stuff going on that he's not sure what he knows. And what's he going to say? What's he going to say? For me, when we were when I was going through these, this is one of those things where and I'm sure it was for you guys as well. You're sitting there thinking, oh, my God, this is this is awesome. This is awesome because we're watching this guy get worked up in here. Oh, it's his execution of that is just beautiful. Um then and, and he starts you're, you're right greg he starts to freeze up he starts to get to where he's we can see him start closing down at this point and um and then you, you cover the head snap back uh when he's but he says absolutely not again saying the word absolutely does not mean you're guilty does not mean you're lying does not mean you're innocent or anything else but you sure hear it a lot when somebody's done something they shouldn't have done and you ask them did they do it and they say absolutely not uh when he says i'm not at liberty to tell you what what the content was that's when it looks like he's taking a punch almost because his head kicks back. Like that's when it hits him that, you know, well, there shouldn't be anything in there. And he's trying to, to look like he's acting, reacting naturally. And that's a big cue right there. As soon as you see something like that, then um, let's see where else y'all, y'all covered most of all the stuff, but man, I, this is, it's so good. It's just such a wonderful setup. This guy, it's, it's, it's almost like a game, you know, it is a game, but, it, but he is literally, getting this guy boxed in body language wise. And we'll see a lot of times you, in the old days, you referred to interrogators as a box man and they were box men. And because you're boxing the person in and you're trying to get them to, to, so there's no way out of the box and you have to say, okay, I did it. In other words, and that's what he's doing. He's doing it. Not just uh, from the talking to him point of view, from the, from the, uh, the vernacular he's using, the words he's using, the construction of the, of the senses and questions he's using, the statements he's saying, but he's also boxing him in body language wise. We'll see that, and there's a reason for that too. But we'll get that to the end. I'm sorry, I'm getting excited here. Um, I'll move on. All right, uh, are we good? Yeah, I want to know what school this guy went to. Yeah. Oh man, but see, the the, the funny a combination. Thing is, you can tell that Williams knows what's going on. Well, he, know, he knows what the bait, he knows what a bait question is. And he, and he's like, oh man, here it comes. I'm there. So he's having this separate conversation, this internal dialogue going, oh, oh no. He, yeah. he may I not know now. what a bait question is, Scott, yeah. but he certainly knows what interrogation approaches are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. If, if he does know what a bait question is, he's lost his memory of that through arrogance. He's walked in there. But this is this is an OPP, you know, DS. So so it's like this is this is a nobody out in the in the boonies. This is a nobody who's yeah. interviewed. But I think he do, I think he does Walked know what him, it is. Going, I used to run a base, okay, and and I'm about to be interviewed by a nobody, and I'm about to get away with this. I think you're right. I think he thinks that guy is just going to be a pushover. I think you. Yeah. But I also think he knows of interrogation approaches and he's hearing a couple of them. Sure. He's not what he's not seeing is the masterful build up of what's coming. That's what he's yeah. missing. Yeah. And you're right, Mark. That's where the arrogance misses that. But I think I think he I think he knows something's up and he just can't figure out what it is. That might be it. Yeah. But I think he knows what's happening because I can I can see that second inner dialogue going on in there of oh right. no. Because his think, his Go ahead. I think it's that big difference between knowing about a bait question and being in that situation. <laughs> we're, we're what? He's like three hours. He's like 
I don't know how many hours into it. Like he he pretty much confesses three hours in or something, something mm. around that. Like so, you know, somebody listens to this and hears about a bait question. Yeah, but then have three in a row and right. you've committed a crime. And like yeah. you know, like hey, I, so you know, I've I've not been through I know what they're doing, but I've not been through that process with with a DS in front of me. The first thing I would do is go, give me a lawyer. Well, well basically, right. exactly. Free to leave. Yeah. Okay, I'm walking out because there's no way I'm sitting down here and answering any questions about anything. You arrest me, or I'm walking her. And if you arrest me, you know I'm still not speaking. I want a lawyer. I get a lawyer. Russell, um, is there anything you can think of? Let's go talk about Marie Franz Como for a minute, okay? Mm-hmm. Is there any reason at all you can think of that during our investigation, obviously we're searching uh, computers, uh, uh, things like Blackberries, right? Mm -hmm. Electronic devices, uh, looking through houses for things that are in handwriting, written notes, diaries, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the content was, but is there any reason at all you can think of why Marie France Como would have specifically Reference you in some of her uh, in some of her writings. Not at all. No. No, absolutely not. Okay. Is there anything that she ever said to you that led you to believe that there might be something uh, more than a passing interest with her towards you? Not at all. No, we spent you know one flight together talking. I'd go back occasionally and talk. No, I, I, if that's the case, that's it. That's very surprising. Okay. All right. God. Um, you have any questions for me right now? No. Okay. I'm just going to step out and see how things are going, okay? okay? I mean, it is a Sunday, but there's probably 60, 70 people working on this file, so there's a mm-hmm. lot of things happening. Sure. Uh, so let me go out and see what's happening, and then I'll, uh, I'll come back in and uh, we'll hopefully continue, okay? okay? I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect, and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible, mm-hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you, it's issues that point at you, okay? And I want I want you to see what I mean, mm-hmm. all right? Okay, Greg, what do you got? So first, Chase, I'd say, have you ever had anybody grab your file and dossier off the table and try to dispose of it in the meeting? In the, yeah, I, it happens in real life. And my favorite thing is you do, you do realize we have more copies, right? But people will grab that because they're so afraid of it. It is so powerful. And this continuation of We Know All. The, Viet, the guys who came back from Vietnam referred to it as file and dossier, and it was a way to track all their life. Now, you already said you got a security clearance. If you got a security clearance, you know you got a tremendous amount of information on him. Um, watch his chest tighten. Even before the guy walks out, watch it. But when he comes back, watch his eyes are riveted to that folder. It's power. That represents everything in the world to him. Not this investigator who's now become his friend by using words like respect and come on, Russ, who's doing we know all, who's doing this file. It's a way to take it off of me and you and not make it about us. It makes it about the crime, and the crime is contained in that folder so that I get your trust. It's powerful. It works. I got a note down here, boa constrictor. Chase, you talked about earlier when a person has their arms around them and whether they're gripping themselves or not. This guy can't breathe because he's gripping himself so tight that every time he exhales, he can't inhale, just like a boa constrictor. And if you watch him, his, sh- his breathing gets shallower and shallower. <laughs> and he stops talking and starts grunting. He's barely emitting sound. Great indicator. We're getting him in his brain case now. He's going back into himself. He's not outward. He's not... A- communicating effectively, and that whole facade starting to crack. This is the beginning of what we all recognize as pre-confession pose. We'll see it really pronounced in the next in the next videos coming up, but this is a great start to it. Chase, what do you got? The eyes on the folder is fabulous. I've seen it so many times. Yep. Even if the folder, uh, in many cases, hypothetically, of course, <laughs> was just full of a bunch of blank pieces of paper. And there's their name on it. A lot. Yeah. A lot of interrogators do that. 
And we'll talk about some of the ways uh, that that happens here in a minute. But I like in this, he's doing a great job of showing all the negativity that's taking place. Anything that's negative going on is outside that door. It's not me. And he's using team pronouns. What are we going to do here? I'd like for us to get this handled. I don't know what they are going to do, which is great. This is why uh, when I train police departments, I say you should almost never have an officer in uniform in the room conducting an interrogation. It should always be a plain, a plain clothes person most of the time. Uh, and, and I subscribe to a, a different interrogation theory than probably Scott or Greg. Uh, my personal philosophy is that if the person knows there's an interrogation happening, then I have lost. Uh, so I, I do a completely different game uh, than, than you guys do. You guys do a lot more uh, criminal stuff anyway. My, uh, my job was a little different. The 60 to 70 people that are working on this is, is a buildup for the technique, the credibility of evidentiary findings. So we see his immediate shift to chest breathing here, these rapid movements, rapid compliance. It's If you look at this again, when the video plays again, I want you to look at this. It's like a maybe an eight or nine-year-old who's been scolded and then said, sit here, I'll be back in a few minutes. You to see the same fear responses there. And it's not deceptive, but it's a lack of information and it is really high stress. And guilty people will tend to want to see what you have on them before they continue to speak. So that's why his eyes are locked on the folder. Innocent people typically, in, in my experience, don't lock on the folder like that. And it, a lot of times it's, it's, doesn't have evidence in there. We're going to see that in a second too. I'll, I'll be talking about that. And in many interrogation schools, they say in a situation like this, we need to apply minimization or rationalization. So minimization, it's not that big a deal. I've seen way worse cases or rationalization. Uh, they had it coming. Anyone in your situation would have done the same thing, that kind of stuff. Not in cases like this. So typically there's damage control, recognition, saving face, significance, or getting in front of the problem, especially in these cases. And, and that's all I'll say about that. And uh, Mark, I'll give it over to you. Oh, wait, did Mark go? Uh, no, no, I'll go. All right. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, what I love about the DS here is, is he knows he's got this folder in the back and I think really he's got at this point he's got about a couple of things in that folder at, at max he has proximity because the next door neighbor didn't work out so he's next in row so that's why he's in it's like okay he's next door neighbor to the next door neighbor um th there's something about tire width and maybe they work this shoe out shoe thing out at this point i'm i'm you know i, I think they have so he's maybe got three things three things in that in that folder pretty thick folder for three things. So, so any comes, but before he plays that, he says, you got any questions for me? Now, what I love about that is before he plays any of his cards, he's always open to going, Hey, uh, just, you know, talk. I'm giving you an option to talk right now. Give me something. If you want to give me something now, it doesn't, it doesn't deliver anything, but what, what a brilliant play. You know, you know, you have potentially your best card in the back, but you don't rush to it. You go, I can play that at any point. I'm going to try another way before I go and play that. I'm just going to go. You got any questions for me and see what happens. Nothing transpires, but I think that's really great technique not to play that card immediately. So he does come back in and yeah, we, we are seeing a lot of stress there. He's locked down. His breathing rate is, is, is right up. And again, the futility is pushed on him. Every time I walk out of this, this room, there's another issue that comes up. It's the futility of do not let me walk out of this room again. Every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up. It's like we got to solve it together right now, and I and I I love that because it's it's pushing the drama in, and and this is a a classic dramatic uh, convention. You know, in Hamlet, it's like Poland are coming, 
Don't let Poland come. And it heats up. It creates this crucible where the thing needs to get solved right there and then because we don't want the outside influence crushing in on us. So brilliantly played there. That's what I got on that one. Who we got left? Me. Oh, okay. God. Yeah. So when he comes, this is a real, the, really the first confrontational uh, situation we've seen it when he, when he confronts him with, with when he comes in and says, you know, I've showed you respect. In, in other words, you know, he's saying, you do not show me respect. There are a couple of ways to go about doing this when you first come in. And he did it right because he, he came in and he was standing when he started saying this. And he hit the word here uh, really hard. But one of the one of the when, when I get a call from somebody from wherever they are and they go, well, so how should I handle this part of it? I always say, when you go in, lean on the table. Anybody ever seen that, that picture of Joe Navarro where he's leaning on the table and he's leaning over? Not that hardcore, but you lean on the table and you look at him and you say, listen, is there any reason whatsoever? So you look at him while you're, why when you, when you start into that, when you start that confrontation, you're dead on him. He's not doing that because he's playing that accountant thing where he's like, Hey man, you know, these guys, I tell you what, here's it's Columbo. And I got to tell them back that they really want to know. I'm just here because I'm working here. Great. He, he handles this very well, but that's like Chase was saying, the different styles of approaching these things, whereas Greg and I may, may be a little bit more aggressive, this guy's really being laid back as he's doing this. And it works great. It's perfect for this, obviously. Um, because when he leaves to check, see, the one thing we didn't have was was the video of him sitting there by himself. Because I don't know how long this guy's been gone. I would love to see that. Love to see him sitting there squirm, thinking, seeing that head going, those eyes going back and forth and him rearranging as we got in there. Because now he's in that position where Chase was saying earlier, and, and Greg's agreeing and everybody's agreeing, it doesn't really mean much you know, when you're doing that. Now it means everything you think you, it means. You've always heard it means the person is stressed. They're not into what's being said, and they're, they're guarding themselves. That's what we're seeing here because his feet are starting to cross. His arms are crossed. He's laying back a little bit. He's pushed back in that chair. We're seeing all the classic signs of, oh, you know what, at this point. Then um, he goes back to reciprocity where he, when he says, you know, I've been and I've been treating you with respect. And again, he's leaning into that. You're not treating me with respect because you're not being completely honest with me. And there are not 60 or 70 people working on this. <laughs> there's there, there's probably nine other homicides they're working on, on, on this thing. But he blows this thing up in this guy's mind like, oh, my God, all these people are doing. It's like ants running around working on figuring this, this thing out. That's not happening. That's not, I mean, he may have told him that. I don't know if you guys have any experience anywhere else, but I've never seen that 60 or 70 people. Just there might not be 60 or 70 people there, you know, much less working on one homicide case. It's the, the departments aren't that big. So uh, then he said, um, yeah, when I came back, when he comes back, he said, I told you I'd treat you the same way that I asked you. Yeah, I ask you to do the same thing. That's where he kind of sticks it up there and says, I, I ask you to do this, the same thing. That's the, he's getting aggressive with him there. So now it's on at this point. It's the, the whole thing is he knows he's pinned and he's getting ready to box him in here in just a couple of minutes. So, uh, so anyway, that's all I've got. I mean, everybody else. Yeah, Chase, a couple of too. things. You know, remember, it, it does vary. Like I, to be a, if you're going to be a hard ass and you're going to do that in law enforcement, that might be one thing. But if you're doing intelligence interrogation or you're doing something with, and remember, that's my my ball of wax is intelligence, and then counterterror. That's a different angle, and then police is a different angle than what Scott yeah. does, where he has to go in and win yeah. these guys over. So, guys, what we want you to hear is every one of these has to take a different approach. And so as a good interrogator, you got, I always say, it's theater for one. You gotta be yeah. believable. From the outside, it might look goofy, but if you're believable to the guy sitting across the table from you, that's what matters. And he's believable to this guy because he's taking yeah. the right approach. It Often, honestly, intelligence interrogation where you're trying to get a guy to commit treason is much like this investigation where the guy's going to roll over and die. I mean, his career is over. It's self, it's, this is personal extinction for this guy. So all that subtlety has to go into it. And I think that's a great call out, Chase. And Mark, what you're hitting on with the futility, all this stuff is starting to come together and the futility will come in one sentence and it's a beautiful close when he does it. I think it comes together nicely. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. And I will yeah, say I, uh, to your point, Greg, the, one of the best things I've learned in interrogation is it costs less uh, cognitive energy to actually care temporarily just sure. to plug that in. So, so I, I never feel like I'm acting, uh, especially in the moment uh, I do, I do the best I can to actually care to where I'm not acting. Cause it, it just burns me out. 
but that's a personal thing for me. Well, if you don't have enough intellectual curiosity to wonder why the guy did it, don't go in this business. Because yeah, yeah, if yeah. you don't really care why the guy did it, you can't do this because it's demanding. Yeah. But if you really care and you're interested, you can meet some horrific people who have done horrific things and sometimes in their own mind for the right reason. It's really interesting work. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. And Greg, you're right. It's theater for one. That's, that's the way I start off. I say, keep in mind what this is. It's theater for one. And once you get that in your brain, that that's what's going on. I never say it's a game, but it really is. I mean, all it is is this big chess game going on. Yep. yep. Oh, I'm getting too worked. Sometimes it's checkers. It just depends on the person. Um, you have any questions for me right now? No. Okay. I'm just going to step out and see how things are going. Okay? okay. I mean, it is a Sunday, but there's probably 60, 70 people working on this file. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of things happening. Sure. Uh, so let me go out and see what's happening. And then I'll, uh, I'll come back in and uh, we'll hopefully continue. Okay. okay. I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect, and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as just read as possible, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you; it's issues that point at you, okay? And I want to, I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? That's true, too. That's true, too. This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Yeah. Okay? All right? Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale. Okay? Okay. All right? That's not to scale. That's... The footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch. Okay. okay? But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Yeah. I'm going to move this over so you can see what I mean. All right. Because essentially, when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially what we're talking about here is, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position, yeah. okay? This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Yeah. now. I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like uh, like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare, mm -hmm. so we're gonna get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yep. These are identical. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is, this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. Well, you need to explain it because... 
Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so now his face has stopped all movement. He's got a fake confusion thing again, and it's gone rapidly. He's got shorter utterances. Um, you can see he's just kind of falling apart. Now, on the other side from the interrogator, the we know all is here tightly. Look, it's your vehicle, your boots, you. Progressively tighter loop. And then he goes out of his way to say, look, I've been trying to help you. There's a clear accusation. There's a trust request again. It's that whole thing of, look, I, I gave you this. There's the dangling the carrot. There's one last incentive. Look, I'm going to try to help you, but you have to help me too. You can hear, I'm your advocate, but things are running out very quickly. There's an incentive with a timeline, and this feeds to his next ploy, which is going to be, okay, the, I'm going to take away the carrot if you don't do what I need you to do. But there's fake confusion. There's short utterances. Remember I talk about a guy being trapped in his own head? When a person's trapped in their own head, everything slows down. And they sit there and they think they're thinking at normal speed, but they're actually, I'm sorry to giggle, but they think they're thinking at normal speed and they're rolling over dumb ideas in their head at increasingly snail-like pace. So the silences get longer and longer and longer. And Chase, you hit it dead on. The master interrogator sits there quietly and waits. The junior interrogator feels like they need to keep adding details. Women... You're watching our show, you know men don't know when to shut up talking when they're trying to close a deal on a date or any of that kind of thing. Men are masterful talkers in their own minds. We don't know when to shut up, and this is a good example. Most interrogators don't know when to shut up. The reason women become masterful interrogators is because they listen, they stop, and they're quiet. You also will notice once he does have anything to grasp onto, his head whips toward it when the guy mentions something. His head whips like, a, like he's in some kind of a crazy place. All these things being called out, do we hear a single denial anywhere? Not one. This guy's in his own little brain case spinning in circles right now at a very slow rate of speed, and he feels like he's moving rapidly. Uh, Mark, what do you get? Yeah, so first brilliant thing that happens here is uh, the DC manages to shift Williams from his, um, from his resistance posture. And he does that by, you know, what you'd normally do if you were being polite and giving somebody something, you'd hand it right into their space. What he does is just push it forward onto the table where it's not going to be quite visible. So Williams has to come forward, open up his body and destabilize himself. So again, first of all, we make our places and then those places decide how we're going to act and react the way we're going to think. So he destabilizes them with this. It's a technique that I'll often use if I want to get information out of people or them to tell me stuff that they wouldn't normally tell me so quickly. I'll just say, hey, t just take a look at this for me and let's look at it together and by getting their eyes down onto the document or the drawing or whatever it is i can then scooch by right next to them sit right next to them we're not we've not got eye contact so there's no um there's no aggression uh, there's no pushback there and we can sit and we can talk about what we have in front of us we can make that the problem and if we make this the problem and the issue they'll start talking about that problem and that issue rather than it being a problem and an issue between us in antagonism so it's great that he manages to shift him from that resistance posture you see him doing the comparison they're trying to work out you know are there is there is there something that could be different enough that i could go hey that's not my boot but there's nothing there so he ends up nodding along to the thesis uh smith is laying on just a lot of futility here but he does soften it by giving him an exit. You know, it was your vehicle, your boots. I'm not saying you did it, I'm just saying, can we, can we just sign up to the idea that your vehicle and your boots, I'm not saying you were in the boots at the time. We're, we'll get there eventually, but if you wanna go, yeah, so it was possibly my, yeah. I mean, I guess it could have been my boots. Okay, great, so explain that. How, how would have your boots, been going. If we're saying it's your boots, how did that happen? It's a great option that he might sign up to the boots. I think we see some contempt and disdain there. I'm not sure when. I just have it as a note here. So take take a look back there. I haven't said when it is at all and what it's to do with, but I've said here that I that I saw it. So um, 
So, so go find it for me and tell me where it was. Uh, look, what's wonderful about this is he's pretty much done now. He's trapped. And at this point, he says, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. So he's got nothing to get himself out of this. And so at this point, I would suggest psychologically, he's now going to accept help. If you give him some help, he's going to go, thank you very much, because I'm out of ideas right now. So I would say DC Smith has him. He has him there in a position where he may well accept some help uh, in this situation. Uh, who have we got next, Scott? Okay. All right. Well, uh, in, in this little folder that he pulls out, I've got one thing that I always teach, and it's the thunk factor. When you pull out that folder, it's got to go thunk really loud and you push it away so they can't get to it. I've never had anybody grab mine before. But so the, the bigger it is, the thunkier it is, but the more power that thing has in it. Um, the time he takes to explain what's happening to the time he confronts them with that, a minute and 53 seconds. That is so wow. As he starts going through that and explaining to him what these things are, it's just if you'll notice, it's just an inch difference in the thing. This guy's freaking out in there he's flipping out so he's thinking what did they know and, and when he finally says when he tells him he's he's nailed oh my goodness but it takes a minute and 53 seconds to get in there and up to that point i don't know if you guys have ever showed a kid like a card trick or some kind of magic trick as you're sitting there doing it and the little kid comes up to the table and this is exactly what he looks like he's looking he's watching trying to figure out what the hell's happening what the hell's going on <laughs> so that that's what that reminds me of. He's so he's so focused. It's it's humorous. It's funny. I don't know why this guy wasn't laughing at him. Um, oh man, I've got so much stuff on here. But and and like going back to Mark's thing, a buddy of mine, uh, Jason, uh, was a sergeant, uh, or and Greg's man, over at um, here in Nashville and on the, in the homicide department. And as we were talking about getting people to open up a little bit. And so what he said he would always do, if somebody was all all quirked up like this, all quirked up, what he would do is say, hey, man, why don't you, will you draw, will you draw something, will you sign something, he'll bring something over so they have to go, okay, and go over here and sign it. And I thought that was brilliant, and I never thought of it. You know, it's so simple, but it's so easy to get them to do it. Um, yeah, this is, we're just, I, I'm just, this is one of those things, in a couple of minutes, it's going to be like a football game, and this, because you, you see, for us, not for the person watching this. You're watching this is it's boring for you, but we're, we're going to get all worked up because, or I do anyway, because it's almost like a football game. He's headed down toward the the, the touchdown, and you're all, you just want to start screaming, "Yeah, man, you got it!" But it's quiet. There's nothing going on. And when we talk about how this is going to be boring, there's not a lot going on. It looks really unexciting, but we we like it. This is what we're talking about. This is the big action. This is that. I don't know what the free throw shot is from a long ways away. I'm not a sports guy. <laughs> Whatever it is, this You're is that or the hail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not Hail Mary. But it's it's that that play where the guy's running down the field and nobody's touching him, but he's he, but they're in front of him and you're yelling for him to get to get through. It's so exciting at this point. God, this is so horribly nerdy to, <laughs> to be saying that, but as quiet as it is. But it's it's anyway, so that's this is coming up on the most exciting part of the whole thing. Uh Chase, what do you got? muted don't say anything <laughs> <laughs> all right chase what do you got i don't know a whole lot about uh, crime scene stuff i do know that uh, you can present fake evidence in the united states but before we get to that this leaning forward thing if you think of the time that you signed the documents to buy your first house, the time you decided to go home with someone at the end of a, a date, the time you decided to marry a person, the time you decided to buy a car that maybe you knew you shouldn't do, any big decision, we lean forward. Anytime I'm training in persuasion, interrogation, doesn't matter what it is, we make big decisions with our backs off of a chair. So the rule of thumb there that I have up on a slide or whatever behind me is never ask a person to make a decision while their back is touching a chair. Slide them a cup of water, slide a document across the table for them to look at, or lean forward and start speaking in a little bit lower tone, which we call a conspiratorial tone, like we're going to tell them a secret. Get them to lean forward. 
leaning forward automatically for most people going to open their arms up. So back to fake evidence. Fake evidence is legal, sadly. And uh, maybe it's a good thing for all the interrogators and police, but it is there and it is legal and it can be presented pretty well. And I just uh, downloaded this crime scene photo of uh, one of the footprints from a suspect in Canada here, <laughs> uh, which you guys may recognize. You'll never take me alive. <laughs> it looks very official. Looks very official. That's how easy it is to build that folder and plop it on the table like, like Scott was saying. So in an interrogation, that is a big deal. His interest level in the evidence would set my meter off where I would just about bet my reputation that the guy's guilty. Just that one reaction of his anticipatory response to examine the evidence, innocent people will look at it and say, there's not, a, there's no possibility that there's a match. I wasn't there. Didn't do it. I know I wasn't there. I don't need to take a look at that unless you're forging something. Mm -hmm. So, I think he's saying footwear and all this other stuff is in the and is in the realm of uh, uh, fingerprints. I don't know if that's uh, a deal or not. I'm not an expert. I'm definitely not an expert in, in that kind of stuff. But his willingness is a bad sign to uh, to investigate this stuff. And he's saying these are identical. Williams is nodding. So the first thing you learn in writing uh, fiction and writing a fiction book is to set a ticking clock from the very beginning or close to the beginning, a ticking clock. And sometimes it's, it's a true ticking clock, like in the movie uh, speed where there's a real clock, but in other times it's, we have to get this file from this office building that's locked up within the next 48 hours or something's going to happen. He's doing this. It gets him out of control. These people are coming in when they come through that door. I don't, this, we're going to lose control really fast. Uh, he's And he says, this is going to be beyond my control, which is a, a beautiful statement here. And then he does a, what's called a compound understanding when he says, we both know X, I need to know Y. So this is a, a what's called a light alternative question. And that would have been great there to say, is it because of A or is it, you know, the bad, the bad thing? And, and, and if, I'm investigating some kind of embezzlement or somebody took some money from a company. I might say there's a human trafficking uh, investigation going on right now. That's downtown. They're, they're laundering a ton of money or they're, they're pulling in a lot of trafficking money into human trafficking. If this is not related to that, I need to know right now, if this was just a simple mistake and you're not feeding these people this money, I need to know as soon as possible. So that's an alternative question where it's a horrible thing, or maybe it was a mistake. So all of his comments uh, have been about status, uh, rank, privilege, and these can be leveraged here. So that would be one of those things where you said, well, if you were just there to check on someone who you, maybe you thought they were in trouble, that's a whole different thing than, you know, you being a bad guy. But I still think this is absolutely masterful. I'm not saying he didn't do it or he did anything wrong. The long pause, the lack of denial, indicators of guilt. And I would say just about everybody in this situation. And when he says, I don't know what to say, this is begging for help. And this is the box. He's about to put the lid on. That's all I got. Hey, at the risk of making this any longer. Also, when people are interested, they lean forward, they put their hands on the document. When they're not, their hands go on their thighs and they lean forward to look at it like it's a poisonous snake in a box. Watch him. Yeah. That's it. <clears throat> And like Chase, what you're saying about fake evidence, if you do have a, a, a folder full of stuff, you have it too much and make sure that some of it, it pokes out. And then you can have a little plastic thing on there so you can peel off a name and put another one on and use the same one pretty much every time. Yeah, done if that a few you were going to do something like that, theoretically. that And the thunk factor, it's got to be something good. This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right, 
Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, okay? Okay. All right, that's not to scale. That's The footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch, okay? okay? But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Yeah. I'm going to move this over so you can see what I mean, all right? Because essentially, when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're, you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially, what we're talking about here is, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position. Yeah. Okay. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago. Okay. Yeah. Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like uh, like fingerprint comparisons. Okay. You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yep. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. You need to explain it because Sorry, one to nine. Um, well, you need to explain it because this is the other problem we're having, Russell. Okay. Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. Okay. So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay. You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. Okay. You and I both know that the unknown offender, male A, on Marie France Como's body, is going to be matched to you, quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay. This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Sciences on call 24 hours a day, helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're applying, the investigators now applying for a warrant to search your office. All right. These aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to. This is a practical steps in an investigation like this. And Russell, Russell, 
Hmm? Listen to me for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works, all right? And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, where's your credibility? Where's your believability? You're just another, uh, and again, don't take this wrong, Okay, but you can see if you step outside this room in your mind and imagine how people are going to view you, okay, if the truth comes out after the clear evidence is presented to you, when you finally go, okay, I'm screwed now. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so he's given the opportunity here to take back some control, and, and that opportunity is pretty overt. Here, and that he says, this is an opportunity to take back some control. The, the DS is very, very clear about, uh, about that. What, what I love, and, and, and um, uh, Chase, you were talking about this conspiratorial, um, I guess, tonality you were maybe saying. He does, he does move his hands into the, what I would call the gesture plane of closure and disclosure, which is a great place to be conspiratorial with people around the around the face because you can you can be covert and then very overt but still in a covert way and essentially that's what he's doing is is going hey we can we can work this out together we don't have to bring in them over there let's not let them in okay let's let's you and me get back some control around this so some very skillful play there of offering him what he wants which is to get control back and you're gonna get that through me and that plays out really nicely for him because he does only in the end want to talk to this ds he wants to deal completely through him he wants him to call him uh russ and not russell you know this is now his best best friend because this best friend is secretly gonna get him out of out of trouble here, of course, he's not at all. He's gonna, he's gonna absolutely slam the lid on him. So there's there. That's what I'll give you uh, on that. Who we got next, uh, Greg? Sure. Yeah. So there's a an act of submission that is one of the most powerful, and that is putting the top of your skull in someone's striking range. His skull is in striking range right now on this guy. He's laid, the, put his head down. When you think of bowing, that's absolutely showing the most vulnerable part of your body. You can't see anymore. Your eyes are focused on the ground. His head is down. He's trapped in inner voice. This guy is now scrambling. All he's doing is revolving around whatever's being said to him. He's reducing his utterances to, you can barely understand him. That's all low energy. That's all internal focus, all inter internal conversation. We've now got him, Mark, when he puts his, his hand to his, his mouth, when he starts to do that, it's pre-confession. Now, I also want you to go back and watch. Remember, I'm going to talk good things about this interrogator, but there's a duck moment instead of swan moment in here. Go find it and tell me where you see him go, uh-oh. You'll hear him double clutch, meaning he's going to step on himself one time, and you can see it. He's like, uh oh, I think I just shot myself in the foot. Find it, write it in the comments below. This is a great moment. One of the few we see in this guy. So when I'm criticizing, it's not criticizing because I think he's not good. It's just he's self-aware enough to realize he's made a mistake. We talked approaches. He is doing pride and ego up. I know you're an intelligent man. He's doing fear up. Fear up, people think of throwing chairs and screaming. No, it's, hey, there's a bear on the other side of that wall right there. And now I got one can of bear spray and it's not for you. That's a fear up. That's not screaming and yelling. That's letting him know there's a threat and he has to do something about it. It's inevitable. You've seen the evidence. Everybody's seen the evidence. There's a lot of people working on this. There's futility. Without saying it's futile, we know all. We have more information than we've even given you. And then there's that incentive. There's still a little bit 
of a chance that you can leave this with some dignity. That's beautiful stuff all starting to come together. He hasn't pulled it all together yet. He's mentioning them individually. In the next round, you're going to hear the most masterful sentence I've heard in interrogation in many years, where he just, it all locks together. And it's a beautiful thing. He's giving him permission to confess. He's being silent and he's allowing this guy to work. And it's working. It's getting in his head. Scott, what do you got? All right. I'll keep this one short. Uh, he's he's about to give up. If he He, he hasn't just yet but he knows he's gonna have to that's that's where his head's sitting but he hasn't yet but he's getting right there and he starts hitting him with this evidence like one two three and you can see there's he knows there's no way out of this at this point he knows it and and smith never uses we us he always says you and i so at this point he gets it back to uh those that out there back to hey man it's me and you so and then he start then he throws out the the lifeline saying and giving him hope of having you know, walking out of there with some respect. Um, it's okay, that's all I'll say. I'll keep it short. Chase, what do you got? I think it's great that he phrases everything positive and in this room, everything that's negative is going to happen is is out there. And these we're executing a warrant on your house. These are decisions we we don't have a choice in. You and I. We can't stop these things from happening. And he uses the word unknown offender uh, to describe the, the person. I just personally would have used the word person. Uh, I would never use a negative connotation uh, for the criminal or the crime. So instead of murder, I would, I would say hurt or something similar to that. Uh, very good job here using the victim's actual name instead of saying the word victim, I think. And your opportunity to take some control here when he's saying this sentence, absolutely brilliant. And he sees him pouring through the evidence and stops. And he decides to just kind of, I'm going to back off a little bit. I'm going to just let, let all of these gears spin because he set the machine in, in motion. And it, it's good to no longer use their name toward the confession. The closer you get towards a confession, the less often you want to use their name. That's what their parents call them. That's what their friends call them. That's what their identity, their ego, their confidence is tied to that name. You, you want to take it, take that away and just say, Hey, what are we going to do here? Leave the name off. So, uh, He's using what's called presuppositions. When they find this, when they knock on the door, when this happens, uh, all of these things, uh, as soon as the experts tell us uh, X, Y, and Z, it's all over. So instead of letting him sit there and stew and think of things, he did that for a few minutes. And then just in case his software wasn't processing all these other stuff, he literally uploaded and installed all the software he needs to make all that happen instead of just letting it happen through natural means, which I think is fantastic. That's one of the things that I teach, just that deliberately installing exactly the program that you need to start running. So he's, he's forcing him. Our brain is a prediction machine. It's number one job is besides keeping your heart beating and breathing is making predictions. So he's forcing Williams to accept new data to add to the prediction formula in his head. So the outcome changes. We're making the outcome darker and darker as it goes on. Brilliant work here. Can't wait for the next video. This is, this is great. That's all I got. Well, you need to explain it because this is the other problem we're having, Russell, okay? Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. Okay? So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized. Okay? You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations. You and I both know that the unknown offender, male A, on Marie France Como's body, is going to be matched to you, quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay? This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Science is on call 24 hours a day helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity to take some control here 
and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm. Okay. We're applying, the investigators now applying for a warrant to search your office. Right. These aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to. This is the practical steps mm. in an investigation like this. And Russell, for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, when that DNA match, when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door, mm -hmm. your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works, all right? And I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation, but I also know your mind's racing right now, okay? Because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years, mm -hmm. okay? The bottom line is, is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, where's your credibility? Where's your believability? You're just another, uh, and again, don't take this wrong, Okay, but you can see if you step outside this room in your mind and imagine how people are going to view you, okay, if the truth comes out after the clear evidence is presented to you, when you finally go, okay, I'm screwed now, Russell, you know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Okay, because I don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it. Got off on having that label. Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. Obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. What are we going to do?
Jessica somewhere where we can find her easily? Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her, or is this something where we have to go and, and uh, take a walk? All right, Greg, you go first. Sure. This is my favorite ever pre-confession by Let's talk about both of them individually, because <coughs> I want to celebrate this investigator in his own sentence. But in the beginning, this guy's asking for an out. You can't miss it. He starts the pre-confession thing. He's dropping his chin. He's trying to get away from, from this. He's looking away. Listen to his respiration. He's going into a very emotional respiration rate, almost like he's about to cry. You can hear emotion starting to take over. Now, remember, I talk about cat brain, monkey brain, lizard brain. This guy's getting out of cat brain and heading back into monkey, back into lizard brain. He's getting to where he's just barely functioning and he's rifling around inside his own head and running around in there, like, a, like I said before, in his own brain case. So now he's given it out and you see that emotion starting to take control of him. He starts to do some throat protecting and then ultimately he puts his hand up this way and balls up. There's a very famous confession by a guy about by of a guy named Rex Krebs who killed Rachel Newhouse in California a few years ago. We need to show that video. It's beautiful and is exactly what he does. It takes longer than this guy does because the guy was not quite as good at closing in on him during interrogation. Now, this investigator runs an approach. Now, we talked about approaches before. He does pride and ego up. He's saying, look, I don't think you're a psychopath, but maybe you are. There's a pride and ego up, pride and ego down, both sides of it. There's a an incentive. I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to give you this opportunity to look. And then he does a fear down. I'm mean, sorry, a fear up by saying, look, maybe you're like this other guy that I in interrogated who's a scumbag. Maybe you're not a good person. Then he lowers his voice and goes into that futility piece. And it just quietly sneaks into this guy's operating system. And then he does a presumptive question. Where are we going to find her body? Game over. Beautiful in to a fantastically orchestrated interrogation. We need this guy on the show. Uh, Chase, yeah. what do you get? This uh, is a technique from a few interrogation manuals, depending on where you look, but you're offering an out, uh, but it's not defined to see if they're willing to grab it. So I'm just going to hang something out, see if they want to grab it or not. Typically, innocent people won't want to grab that. They'll want to leave the room. Uh, and I want you to keep in mind as you're watching this, none of us that are sitting here are immune to interrogation. None of us. There's no, we, we don't get some secret vaccine that makes us immune. In the emotional state that Williams is in right here, all of us would be similarly uh, susceptible or suggestible uh, to a lot of those techniques. They work on em highly emotional people. Uh, and, and I want you to keep in mind, William's brain is hearing less than half of what is being said, less than half. So when they say repetition is the key to interrogation, that's not because you're repeating it to brainwash a person. That's because you're repeating stuff they're not hearing at all in the first place. Uh, so he asked this alternative uh, question, and I think it's being used here masterfully. You can either look like X or why when people hear about this. And depending on what course you take, there's 10 categories for why people confess. There's social preservation, justification, minimization, receiving benefits like a promise uh, or a deal, trust, conscience, evidence, status, desire to confess, and finally force. And there's maybe some other ways or you can pull out a thesaurus and, and grab five or six more. But that's a very common quote. If I thought you were the type of person to do blank, I would not have even come here at all. The reason I'm here is to figure out why this happens so we can both get ahead of this. And another common interrogation phrase, I don't think you'll ever hear in an interrogation video is, I think the reason that you did this is the same reason that I wanted to come in here and talk to you. I think you are a genuine person. I think you did intend to do the right thing. And that's why I came in here. Scott, quit laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I like it where he's saying you're, we're all going to run out of cards to play at 
posts a secondary alternative question. Is it A or B? Are you good or bad? And when he says we're going to run our cards to play, what are we going to do? Instantaneously, he gets, call me Russ. I need to. Yeah, that's pins say. down. Yeah. That's pins down. Yeah. When he says He's that, done. I almost I almost did this just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's done. That was it. Call me and Russ, please. <laughs> if you <Boss>. watch, <laughs> watch this video, my, the final thing I'll say here, when you watch this back, watch right after he says, call me what, Russ, watch the interrogator's body language and the suspect's body language. They instantaneously synchronize and the confession begins. Guys, I Got always say all of this stuff works because of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And what you do, a, an effective interrogator bonds tightly and creates a new normal. So this person is now cr trying to create esteem with the person who's interrogating him. And this was masterful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is this is a part where that long silence, it was uh, 26 seconds after he ends there. And he's just sitting there looking at all that stuff and thinking, and he doesn't say a word, doesn't say anything. At this point, <laughs> I know we're all going, it's like, that's the, that's the long football run at that point. We're all going, yeah, yeah, go. Because he knows he's got to keep it zipped. And so he does right then just put, and the pressure builds on Williams and it builds and builds and builds. And you can feel it in there and you can see it on. That's what, that's the exciting part about it. And so I'll talk about part of his body language stuff as well. He's sitting way back in that chair. And then he comes as he's, as he's, um, oh, and as he's gripping himself, this is the highest his arms have been at this point. This is the highest they've been. And he's, again, like Greg said, it's that bow constrictor thing where he's squeezing himself and it's getting hard to breathe, but he's really, really still. At this point, that that's when, if you'll take a look there, at their body language as well, this is where the, the boxing in comes comes to an end because Smith has him boxed in. He's got him boxed in from, from talking to him. He's got him boxed in from physically being there with him. This is the closest they've been the whole time. And this is usually where if it doesn't go, if he hadn't gotten it there, what he would have done was reached over and touched him on the leg and said, hey, man, listen, I, I, we all make a mistake. He would have gone down that road. You know, he's close enough to reach out and touch him. That's the key right there. Touch him on the leg or touch him on the arm, depending on the relationship you've got going at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, that that's right. You guys have covered a lot of this. Um, but this is a, like a classic uh, confrontational pose. And then when he does say, it's over, like that. And you go, was oh, that too soon at that point? Um, <laughs> duck number two, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, whoops. And he's like, I got, I got, I got, I got. And that's why he keeps talking. But he, his voice, this is the only time his voice changed. It's not a whole lot, uh, Smith's voice, but it starts that lilting a little bit of like, hey, man, it goes down a little bit lower. The tone goes lower. It's not as loud. It's a little bit softer. And he starts saying, you know, hey, man, that's that when he gets into that. And then uh, what he says, what are we going to do? That's when that silence starts because he's and that's he just going, OK, what are you going to do? And that's when we see Smith running down the dang uh, running down the field, and we're hollering for him because that's when it, that's when the decision is going to be made. Am I am I giving up or not? Am I going to give up or not? So that's when he's bobbing and weaving through there, and we see him doing this. But we're all hollering for him. Um, yeah, that's and you guys got most of it there. So Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So uh, so remember, right at the start, I was saying about there's this power play going on. And just think about Williams as he walked in. Just cast your mind back to that, to that character who walked in. And now who have we got? And, and how quickly that happened. I think we're at like three and a half hours here, maybe, maybe. Maybe we a little are. bit more, maybe a little bit less, but maybe three and a half <laughs> hours. We've been um, going about three <laughs> Not not our show, but yeah. <laughs> although we may be, we may be. I don't know. You yeah. tell me. But uh, but in terms of the interview here, the interrogation, it's about three and a half hours down the line, and and we talked about okay, this uh, the DC here is going to build this idea of futility. Well, he builds it to the point where he can be totally overt about that, and he says, you know, there is only one option. Now, what better sentence describes futility? you know there is only one option yeah and and then but he's not finished 
because he's got a nice little card up his sleeve there where he plays Bernardo. So for anybody who doesn't know, Bernardo is a legendary serial killer um, in Canada, actually just from up the road in Scarborough, but not not far off Trenton, okay? And, and he, you know, the DS here kind of assigns some kind of knowledge to Bernardo. Everybody knows Bernardo, but he kind of ascribes some kind of connection with him as well. So there is that moment of, hey, if you, if you want to join, if we want to join together and be like a Bernardo, you can, we can do that because like I've done a Bernardo before. So if you want to go down Bernardo, I'm good. Let's, let's do that. If you want to go down another route, of not being that character. Hey, I'm good for that as well. I'm with you all the way. But ultimately he goes, but regardless of where it's going, this is over. <laughs> now, again, just hits the futility there. Again, we get a lot of sighs from uh, Williams, a lot of suspended breathing as well. So I don't think his breathing quite knows what to do at this point. I don't think his mind quite knows where to go on this. Um, and so and so we get that silence and we get hey what what are we going to do and he's got nothing he's got nothing which again causes us to understand that he's now open to any offer any offer he's done now if he'd have gone down the route of what do i want to do um i want a lawyer now that would be a whole different that'd be a whole different thing but he hasn't even got that so he can lay down the idea of look where where are the bodies? It, it leads into let's get a map. You know we're going to walk out. We're going to walk around. You're going to point to it on the map. There's that you can watch more of this yourselves and see where this leads. But ultimately, what we're saying here is it it's at this point where it is over for him because he's been boxed in. The lid is down. It's futile, and he's now not in control of this at all. And what a brilliant image of who you had walking in, smiling at the camera at the start and who you have right now. All credibility there uh, to DS Jim Smith. Uh, I know you're in the area, so it'd be lovely to say hi at some point. So uh, you, you, our, our door, uh, our virtual door is open to you anytime. And my, yeah. my actual door uh, is open to you. Uh, We're any, big fans. Yeah. 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 That's what I got for you. Yeah. Too exciting. Yeah. So if you, yeah, if you, if you see this, hit us up. Uh, it's the behavior panel at gmail.com. Russell, you know, there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Okay. Cause I don't get me wrong. I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it. Got off on having that label. Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. What are we going to do?
What are we going to do? Call me Russ, please. Okay. What are we going to do, Russ? Jessica somewhere where we can find her easily? Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her, or is this something where we have to go and, and uh, take a walk? And if anybody's still watching this, please subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> the one, the single person, my mother, mom, subscribe. So, yeah, just hit that little red thing down there and subscribe to our channel. <laughs> All right. Thanks, this is guys. a good one, fellas. All right. I'll yeah. see you next time. See you guys. Bye now. The behavior panel. All right, Chase, what do you got? I'll be sad and 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 I'